Thank you. The next item of business, as follow-on business, is a debate on motion 10411, in the name of Myrtle Fraser, on pausing the short-term let's licensing scheme. I would invite those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons, and I call on Myrtle Fraser to speak to and to move the motion up to 11 minutes, please, Mr Fraser. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The uh, tourist sector is vitally important for Scotland. It is the largest part of our economy in terms of employment and is particularly important in remote and rural areas where other job opportunities may be limited. It is made up of thousands of small operators right across the country, often self-employed. And yet this vital sector is today under an existential threat due to the botched introduction of a licensing scheme for short-term lets, the unintended consequences of which are already causing huge concern and could see the shedding of thousands of jobs. It is a direct result of the actions of this Scottish Government and it is entirely in their gift to resolve this issue. <laughs> Presiding officer, that is why today the Scottish Conservatives have taken this debate to the Chamber, asking the Scottish Government, even at this late hour, to pause for one year the introduction of their licensing scheme to allow for a full review and consideration of those unintended consequences. And I would appeal to ministers to listen to what we and others are saying in this debate, to what industry bodies and the wider business sector are saying outside this chamber, and to take a common sense approach and agree a halt. Otherwise, the consequences for the wider Scottish economy could be devastating. Presiding officer, I do not know of anyone in this debate who does not think some level of regulation for self-catering is unnecessary. Mm -hmm. There is a well-documented problem with what are known as party flats, particularly in city centre locations causing disruption for permanent residents. The actual numbers may well be small in relation to the overall size of the industry, but it is nevertheless an issue that does need to be addressed, and we have never argued otherwise. Of course, already councils have power to grant or withhold planning consent for the operation of short-term lets. In addition, we now have short-term let control areas which councils have the power to introduce and to operate. A well-regulated short-term let sector is a social good. It's important not just to tourists, although it's very important to the tourist economy, but many other sectors of society, including commercial travellers, those whose work takes them to different parts of the country on a regular basis, those needing somewhere to stay on a temporary basis whilst perhaps moving house, or while having renovation works done to their property, or even victims of domestic abuse who need to find temporary accommodation need access to short-term lets. Not everyone wants to stay in a hotel, and the privacy, affordability and convenience of a short-term let makes sense for many people. And one of the problems with the Scottish Government's licensing scheme is that it does not just affect standalone self-catering units, which are apparently the cause of the issues we hear about. It also affects individuals who let out their spare rooms. An issue, of course, in Edinburgh during the festival, as we've just seen, when many performers and visitors come and stay in people's houses. And it's no wonder that amongst festival organisers, there is a real concern as to whether the city will provide sufficient accommodation in future years to allow our very successful festivals, such an important part of the city economy here in Edinburgh, to continue. And the licensing scheme also impacts traditional bed and breakfasts and guest houses. Already well-regulated sectors of the market, already having to comply with a whole host of regulations, and yet an additional set of burdens and costs are being put upon them, and it even applies to house swaps, where people swap houses with others in a different country. And there is no evidence whatsoever that these categories I've referred to are generating complaints about antisocial behaviour, but they are all caught up in the new rules. And already there is evidence that operators are simply not applying for a licence, uh, and therefore many are potentially intending to leave the market. The costs and bureaucracy involved in making an application 
means that for those running a small operation, perhaps I'll just give away in a second and make this point, such as letting out one bedroom in a bed and breakfast, they're asking themselves if it is worth their while going to the cost of applying for a licence. And the consequence will be a shrinkage in the provision of accommodation for visitors and an impact on the very tourist sector on which we as a country rely so heavily. I'll Thank give way to Mr Johnson. I'm very grateful to the member for giving way, and, and I think he's right about those who may be making that choice, but there are many operators who simply don't know that this legislation, this regulation applies to them. I've knocked on doors in my constituency where B&Bs have thought, because they have not received any correspondence, that simply they don't need to apply because it doesn't apply to them, and it does. Is that not a very big problem? Murder Fraser. Yeah, Mr Johnson is absolutely correct to raise that particular uh, issue. I think as of uh, uh, August, 84% of short-term lets had not applied for a licence. That suggests there is a major issue with people not being aware of this requirement. And I've heard anecdotally, and I'm sure others in the Chamber have too, of operators simply not aware, and including people operating bed and breakfasts, simply not aware that these regulations are coming in and they are required to comply with them. Otherwise, potentially, they'll be committing an offence uh, after the 1st of October if they haven't applied. And, presiding officer, there was never any need for a one-size-fits-all approach to legislation. It would have been perfectly possible for the Scottish Government to have devolved to local councils the right to drop rules for their own areas. Those with a history of complaints about the operation of self-catering lets would then have had the opportunity to take a different approach from those in other, perhaps more rural areas, where self-catering lets have been operating as part of the tourist sector for decades more, without any problems appearing. I think it's a source of regret that the Scottish Government decided to introduce a national scheme instead of letting councils have the discretion whether to introduce it locally. Now, presiding officer, those who uh, support the legislation would argue that a proliferation of short-term lets drives up housing costs, reduces affordability, and contributes to a cost of housing crisis. And yet I would point them to the analysis done by the Fraser of Allender Institute of the Business Regulatory Impact Assessment for the legislation. And this reveals that the Scottish Government has made no attempt to quantify the number of properties which might be released from secondary letting and then made available as permanent homes as a result of the licensing scheme. In the words of Fraser of Allender, Section E of the BRIA is, and I quote, notable for the absence of any quantification of impacts. And the headline figures quoted for the numbers involved in short-term lets include those renting out their spare rooms. It must surely be highly unlikely that, that should they cease this activity, they are going to be selling up and thus providing additional accommodation for those currently seeking it. And such anecdotal information as we have to date supports the view that there will be no boom in affordable properties as a consequence of the legislation. Quoted in the Herald newspaper just last week, Mark Tate, the chief executive of the Cairngorms Chamber of Commerce, stated that of the 16 properties in his area he was aware of that had so far withdrawn from the market uh, as a result of the new rules, 12 had become second homes. So these have gone from being economically active for 35 to 40 weeks of the year, occupied by people coming to visit and putting money into the economy, to being occupied for no more than two to three weeks in the year. It is the worst possible outcome. Uh, yes, I'll give one. Craig Hoy. Way. Does he agree with me that this government is willfully ignoring the very real fears of those operating in the short-term let sector? And is he aware of the case of my constituent, Linda, who went to discuss her plight with Paul McLennan, uh, her constituency MSP, and the minister responsible for this policy? Linda told him that she stands to lose her only source of income, her entire business, and possibly the roof over her head as a result of his short-term let's policy. Mr McLennan's response was that, quote, she ought to start looking for another job. Does the member agree with me that this shows the utter and complete contempt of this minister and this government towards those who live in and work in our short-term lets and B&B sectors? And given the chaos and harm that this policy will inflict, shouldn't it be Mr McLennan rather than Linda who's looking for another job? Mr. Fraser. I, excuse well, me, well, the Minister would intervene on the member, not on me. I don't know. Well, I, 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 you know, I, I should say to the Minister, who I'll give way to in a second, but I should say to the Minister, I, I met Linda last week, and the story she told me was actually even worse than the one that Mr Hoy has recounted, because not only did apparently Mr McLennan tell her 
that she should look for another job. Subsequently, a member of staff said she could go on benefits should she not be able to get a job. Mr McLennan owes Linda an apology. Will he give her one now? Minister Paul McLennan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I met with, with the constituent that was membered and, and agreed to try and help the constituent ask for additional information, which was, never, which was never received. And that's noted. So I, I'm, I, that's all I want to say on, on that matter. Murder Fraser. Well, presiding officer, no apology from the minister to Linda for his member of staff telling her she can go on benefits because this government is going to take away her business, presiding officer. So, so we, so the, but it'll be back to the point I was making. You know, there's no evidence we're going to see more availability of properties. And you know, colleagues will be fam familiar with a pattern uh, in many rural areas, including the Highlands and the Islands, where individuals will often inherit a rural property, such as a croft house, to which they have a strong family and nostalgic attachment. And these houses are then retained by families, or perhaps used for a few weeks a year by family members, but are rented out to visitors on a short-term basis when they're not in use. And the consequence of this legislation is that people decide they're not going to let them out as self-catering units. All that's going to happen is that they're going to lie empty for much of the year with a loss of spending power to visitors in these communities. And it's also a fact that in many rural areas, the uh, properties available for short-term lets can often be large multi-room lodges, often in very remote locations, which by no stretch of the imagination would ever be affordable accommodation for local families. So there is little prospect of this legislation helping address the housing crisis that exists in many parts of Scotland. And the answer to that, presiding officer, is simple. We must build more houses and make sure they're affordable. And today we learn that the construction of affordable housing in Scotland is at a 10-year low under this government. That's the answer to the housing crisis. There's no point Mr Lockhead waving at us. He's been in um, government for members... 16 years. Sorry, playing off. I, I was, Mr McLennan, please take a seat. I was just reminding members that they shouldn't... <laughs> Minister, please resume your seat. Thank you. I was reminding members that they should perhaps just be listening to the person who has the floor and not making sedentary interventions. Murder Fraser, you have the floor, but you should be thinking of... I, I'll happily take another, if I have time. Um, I'm afraid you don't have time to take another intervention, but you have a bit of latitude because you have already taken three interventions. You are over your time, but I'll allow you sufficient time to conclude your remarks. All right, thank you. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, my apologies to the Minister. I'm, I'm not permitted to take his further intervention, but we'll be hearing from him in, in a moment. So, in conclusion, presiding officer, no one in this debate is opposed to sensible and proportionate regulation. But what is being introduced by this Scottish Government is the proverbial sledgehammer to crack a nut. Even at this late hour, we would call on the Scottish Government to think again. This is a government that claims it wants to reset its relationship with Scottish business. It has a new deal uh, for business group established. Well, presiding officer, today is the first test of whether that approach amounts to anything more than empty words. If this Scottish Government is serious about listening to business, about avoiding the damage to the vital tourist sector, it needs to agree a pause in this legislation to allow a proper review. That is what our motion says, and I'm pleased to move it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Fraser. I would advise that we do have some time in hand at the moment, and therefore, uh, where interventions are taken, I have a bit more latitude to allow time back for the member who is making the contribution. I now call Paul McLennan, Minister, to speak to and to move Amendment 10411.3. Uh, up to nine minutes, please, Mr. Thank McLennan. you, Officer. And I formally move the motion in, in my name. And just the point I want to make an intervention, what Mr. Fraser didn't mention in terms of that, there was also a, a 23 year high in terms of completions that the Scottish Government have brought forward. And if we're going to be talking about impacts on house building, all we need to look at is interest rates and inflation, construction inflation brought, yep. brought forward by this Conservative exactly. Government. So I want to touch on that point and put that on, on record. So I, I want to put on record, as my colleagues have previously said in this chamber, my unwavering support for the many excellent businesses that provide short-term late accommodation in Scotland. In recent years, this industry has grown significantly, which has brought about an increased range of choice for visitors and a boost for regional economies. The ripple effect of good business supporting good business. However, for well over five years, parties across this chamber, all parties across this chamber, have urged us to take action to regulate the growth of short-term lets, noting that growth and good quality do not always go hand in hand, and there was an increasing concern about members, amongst members and wider society about the impact 
on communities, which I'm sure we'll hear about later on. The introduction of licence and safeguards, if I can make some progress first of all, the, license, the introduction of licence and safeguards, the role which short-term lets play in our economy by providing assurance to guests on safety and quality and brings the sector into line with other accommodations such as TELS, levelling the playing field to protect the reputation of well-managed businesses. I also want to make it clear, I just want to make some progress, I'll, I'll take the intervention in a second. I also want to make it clear that there are thousands of good quality operators at the moment basic standards aren't always being met. We are a government that believes in fair regulation and we do not believe that asking short-term let operators to comply with mandatory conditions and completing license application is too much to ask. Quality and safety are at the heart of our scheme, whether their accommodation is being offered as a traditional bed and breakfast, other home sharing arrangement or standalone self-catering accommodation. This was an aspect that was as well tested through the three public consultations and the development of legislation in this Parliament. This, the safety component is mandated for all types of visitor accommodation in Scotland. Happy to take your intervention, Mr Johnson. Uh, Daniel Johnson. I, I thank the, the Minister for taking the intervention. I just think it's important that we have clarity on the terms of the debate. He, he talked at the beginning of his statement about tackling the growth in short-term lets. So let's be clear, it's the planning process which controls growth. It's, is it not correct that licensing cannot control the numbers, simply standards, just so that we're clear in terms of the debate? Minister. Yeah, of, of course, I mean, the short-term control areas, which I'll touch on later on as, as part of that much broader uh, debate we're kind of touching on, but we're talking about licensing areas, which I think is incredibly important. And there's various quotes from various members in the debate going back to that time, talking about that particular issue and about how we need to monitor the standards of safety around about that. And I'll touch on that later on in the debate. So as we approach the first of October, and standards have to meet that growth as well, Mr Johnson. As we approach the 1st of October deadline, it's important that colleagues across the Chamber do the right thing, do the right thing to encourage and support operators to apply to this scheme. In fact, yesterday I wrote to all MSPs setting out some key information on the scheme, which I hope they will find helpful to share with their constituents. If you just like to make progress, local authorities stand, support, stand ready to support applicants having already accommodated a six-month delay to their original implementation plans. I would like to recognise their role as statutory licensing bodies who have already processed thousands of applications. And I've met with SOLA on a number of occasions and spoke to them about that. And some of the comments coming through that were applicants actually stating the process was much simpler than they were told previously. Now, and of course, in Edinburgh, the Council also applied to us for short-term light control area, as Mr Johnson knows. At that time, in summer 2022, Cammy Day, the Lenin Labour uh, Deputy Council Leader said, this is the news we've been waiting for. I am delighted that ministers have now finally answered our calls. Go faster, he said. President Officer, it's instant to see Labour have changed their tune in that period of time. Yep. Just last month, Cammy Day uh, came out unilaterally and called for an, a, a delay to the, the application date for another six months. He was shot down. He was shot down, if you let me complete the point here. He was shot down by his Labour council colleagues, shot down. Every single uh, uh, Labour colleague had a go at him in, in that, uh, that particular guard. What's really important, and they also came out in as much as February, where every party said they regretted the delay from February to October. Yep. Edinburgh councillors support licensing. Why doesn't Edinburgh la Labour par uh, parliamentarians here in this place? They, they don't talk to them. Obviously, they don't talk to each other in that regard. I'll take your intervention. Mr. Mr. Th I thank the Minister for taking this in intervention. He talks about colleagues. His own SNP colleague, Tommy Shepherd, has said this isn't about home sharing, where people let out a room. Um, in their home for the festival. There's still some work to be done there. Well, I'm sorry, but this is exactly what this legislation is about. It's that group of people being captured. I think the minister, when he was on committee, understood that. Now he's a minister. He hasn't done anything to change that. Why not? And what is this work which his colleagues say needs to be done? Minister. Thank you, Mr Briggs. And, and you also remember you were part of that committee at the same time. I'd previously spoke, spoke to the festivals. I'd previously spoken to the festivals before I became a minister on that issue, and I understand these issues and we'll continue to, uh, to dialogue, we'll continue to speak to them on that regard. However, you also remember at that particular committee, Mr Briggs, you also voted for the, the motion that went forward into the committee. You voted for that motion, so uh, and you had an opportunity Minister, then... Minister, we, we need to speak through the chair, because otherwise you're referring to me and I had nothing Sorry, to, yeah. to do with it. Mr Briggs voted, voted for the motion that was brought forward by, by, the, by the, the committee at that particular time. He had a chance to raise issues at that time and vote against what was discussed at that particular time. So I want to touch and just move on. Scotland scheme is open to applications and has been since October last year. There are no caps, there is no cliff edge, and there have been no licence refusals to date. By submitting an application, hosts are not only de demonstrating their commitment to quality and safety, but also to being responsible members of their local communities, for visitors to our own beautiful country. Knowing that their accommodation is licensed means that they completely trust their booking. Another feather in the cap to Scotland's quality tourism officer. And of course, 
Scotland is not alone in considering this issue. The regulation of short-term lets has become the focus of policymakers worldwide. Scotland doesn't stand alone in this. Other countries have sought to place entire bans, entire bans on allowing residents to rent out their home, or whether the use of a residential property is changed to commercial enterprise to require hosts to pay huge amounts of compensation. Scotland's scheme aims to strike a balance, granting powers to councils to make decisions that are appropriate to local areas. I will take one more intervention. Sue Webber. That is fine. The recent court ruling in Edinburgh does raise questions about the legality of some of the aspects of these regulations. So can the SNP government guarantee that these regulations are actually legally robust and won't be struck down further in the courts? Minister. Thank you. Uh, if you uh, just to address the point that the, the, the member made, one, one of the key things when the scheme was first, was first brought forward was uh, never getting the, the, the balance in terms of whether, you know, whether it's controlled by f fully local uh, Scottish government or given that power to local authorities. The power were given to local authorities at that time. That's the feedback we got from local authorities at that particular time. They asked for that. Now, that's a matter for Edinburgh Council. They got the judgment and have changed their, 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 their figures, their ruling around about that, and that will continue to be some of the discussions. But this was feedback from the, 20, the consultation we had previously on that, that the councils wanted that particular power. Now, I want to come back in terms of the scheme striking a balance, granting power to councils to make decisions that are appropriate to local areas, but with core mandatory safety conditions. That's what they asked for. Now, our government firmly believes in balancing the impact of the growth of the short-term let sector, which grew threefold in three years from 2016 to 2019, with promoting thriving communities. In fact, the role of the scheme in terms of housing itself is often misreported. So let me put on record, President Officer, all the scheme does not cap activity. There is an important interaction with our statutory planning system, which needs to be fully understood as part of this debate, which is one that the motion is drafted glosses over. Put simply, put simply, I said it was only going to take the three, so let me continue, please. Put simply, if someone chooses to change a residential property from being used as a home from living in to being used entirely to host visitors, this may well be a material change of use. It has always been the case that material changes of use require planning permission. A pause to the licensing scheme will not change this long-standing requirement. Now, as Minister for Housing, I am committed to increasing the availability of affordable housing. But if we are losing homes under the radar, the efforts that this government makes and which taxpayers fund to build more affordable housing will always be hampered. Now, I want to talk about our willingness to change and what we've done in that period of time since this was brought forward in the 2018 programme for government. It's been 20 months since legislation was passed to give effect to the scheme. People know that. Local authorities' schemes have been open to application since October 2022, and there was a six-month extension to the application deadline for existing hosts. Now, since starting the post in March, I've met with the SSSC, STA, residents groups, community groups, SOLAR, and as recently as yesterday, I met booking platforms to discuss their the perspectives. They were very constructive in discussions, and one of the key messages that came in through, they are encouraging, asking their members to sign up to the scheme. We agreed to meet very soon. So there's always that willingness to change and that willingness to discuss what the, as the scheme uh, uh, goes on. Now, at various points in the process, we made various changes in response to feedback. We reduced liability insurance requirements, removed over-provision powers, amended conditions to facilitate home sharing, created, uh, created means of uh, facilitating temporary exemptions to allow councils to provide for Scotland's flagship festivals and events. We also listened last year and granted a six-month extension for existing hosts to apply for the scheme. I there, therefore think the Conservative Party has called for a detailed and evidence-based review out of touch where things are. Some in this chamber may have missed the last five years' development of this legislation, so let me remind them. Three separate public consultations detailed independent research, six impact assessments, including a 100 page, over a 100-page business re regulatory impact assessment, a stakeholder working group that met through the development of legislation, and an industry advisory group chaired by Visit Scotland, which has convened regularly and continues to meet. Now, what, of course, we are open to is continuing to improve implementation, and we are committed to updating this early in the next year. That was always the case. Murdo Fraser asked us to pause the introduction of the scheme, a scheme which has been open since October 2022, a scheme which 7,000 763 applications have been received and growing, and where 4,708 applications have been issued. So as long, and this is a really important point, so long as the existing hosts submit a licence application by the 1st of October, there is nothing to fear. Let me say to operators out there, loud and clear, that your local authority will work with you to be able to process the application. Next steps. I want to absolutely... We Minister, want to could you start to bring yeah, your mic to I'll conclude. In conclusion, I strongly reject the, the opposition's claim that the scheme could be paused to wait for a further review. Our government has taken more than sufficient time to develop an approach to an issue that has been raised by all parties and we have uh, prioritised the short-term lets 
sector's voice in its development. The scheme has been in place since 2022 and presents fair regulations. We have listened to the concerns of the sector. We are making sure that continue, as long as applications are in by the 1st of October, they are allowed to continue, as, and they have 12, the local authorities have 12 months to come back to that. So we're actively engaging in the next steps to plan sensible updates to the scheme, and we'll continue to work with the sector and partners to progress this. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Mark Griffin uh, to speak to and to move Amendment 10411.2. Mark Griffin is joining us remotely. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Though I have not operated in the short-term let sector, I draw members' attention to my register of interest, which shows that I ceased to be the owner of a private rental property um, this summer. Um, President Officer, the licensing regime for short-term lets is, uh, in its current form, completely unnecessary for large parts of the country. Scottish Labour voted against the regulations when they came to Parliament in 2021, and we still think that they need to be reformed now. We support a delay to the scheme and for a detailed review of the impact of the licence and regulation, and then for changes to be made. And with a, a housing bill finally coming in this parliamentary year, we think that will provide the right vehicle for changes to be made. The, the regulations were badly drafted. Uh I think we've got a technical hitch with Mr Griffins. Um, I, I propose we give it another minute and see if we can... No? Nope. I propose we still give it another minute and see if we get Mr Griffin back. Okay, I think what we will do is we will go now to Willie Rennie and we will come back to Mr Griffin. Uh, Mr Rennie, you have up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Uh, we all support the Conservative motion. Uh, we support a delay in the licensing scheme because the burden is too high for many. The signs are that this could lead to a major hole in our tourism offer, threatening jobs and our offer to visitors. But we have to admit that there is a problem with the growth of short-term lets. We should not deny that, just in a second. And in some areas, they are severe, but the problems are different in different parts of the country. I'll take an intervention. I, I, thank, I thank Mr Rennie for taking the intervention. I ask this question in, in good faith. The Liberal Democrat group in the City of Edinburgh Council have been one of the supporters of applying these regulations to the greatest extent here in the capital city. And I just wondered what dialogue there had been between Liberal Democrat parliamentarians and their city councillors here in Edinburgh. Willie you ready? And, and there has been dialogue because we recognise there are different issues in different parts of the country, which is what I'm going to, to come on to. Because in my part eh, of Scotland, in the East Nuke of Fife, short-term lets and importantly second homes, which has been absent from this debate so far, are at such a level in some villages that there just isn't sufficient homes for locals. Those communities won't be sustainable for much longer without a substantial full-time permanent population. The shops won't stay open, the schools could shut, the business could, could close, in part because there are not enough workers, because they themselves can't find a home to live in. Take the Balcomi housing development in Crail. Apart from the social housing section at the back of the new development, all the other properties, bar a few, are now used as short-term lets and second homes. And that's with just within a few short years of the estate being built. Ten miles away in St Andrews, the situation is even more acute with large numbers of very welcome students and staff from the university. But the combination of the two make it even harder to find a permanent home. The problem of the East Nuke is replicated in the Highlands, except the distances are even larger, making the severity even sharper. In Edinburgh, where Mr McPherson has an interest, the party flats, with all the antisocial behaviour that comes with that, add a different complexion again. So that, not just now, so there is a problem. But that doesn't mean we should remove large numbers of perfectly good short-term lets from the market because we need them for a thriving tourism industry. 
A certain number of short-term lets are essential if we want people to visit here and spend their money here. The short-term lets employ cleaners, plumbers, joiners and more. The visitor attractions need the short-term lets and those attractions employ more people, sometimes in parts of the country with few other employment opportunities, not just now. Those workers need short-term lets for their wages, but this is the rub. If there are too many short-term lets in the second homes, those workers won't have anywhere to live. It's all about balance. And you wouldn't think that from this debate. It's about making sure we have both as sustainable. Short-term lets can be a good thing, but too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And my concern is that we don't have balance. The licensing scheme is too heavy-handed. It's nationwide and has been a victim of mission, not just now, has been a victim of mission creep. The reach has now caught yurts, house swaps, rooms in people's homes and bed and breakfasts. Imposing controls on those properties won't tackle the problem of insufficient housing for locals, nor will it bring an end to the party flats. All these different problems won't be solved with a simplistic national measure like a licensing scheme. The licensing scheme is one size fits all, with a requirement on every council to live with the strictest of arrangements, even though they have no local need for them. The legislative opportunity here has been squandered by this government, and that's why it's so frustrating. I'll take an intervention from the Minister. Minister. Thank you, Mr Rennie. A few points, I think, for that. One, in terms of the average costs for five, it's around about £250 to £450 over a three-year period. So you're talking about a five a week in terms of that. Five pounds a week could be added into that. In terms of the feedback we've had from, from Solar, including uh, Fife, they're, they're saying, obviously, and they're there to work with the sector very much, to work with applicants in terms of that. They're finding, and the feedback directly from them and other local authorities is they've found the, the process much easier than, than, than they've been told. And I think the other key thing, if we, if we, we've kind of lost this, goes back to original discussions and the previous parliament talking about this. Is this is where local authorities asked for these powers to do this. It wasn't a national scheme. It was a national scheme looking at, but, but having, but having, local authorities having the power to do what they need to do in terms to regards to their own local areas. That's what this, the previous parliament voted for, and that's what we're enacting and what we're doing today. Willie Rennie. I, I don't know who the minister is speaking to, because that's not the feedback uh, I am receiving. And when he says that local authorities have the flexibility, they don't have flexibility to take out B&Bs. They don't have flexibility to take out um, the, the yurts or the house swaps or any of the other measures that we've talked about. There is no flexibility. It's a national standardised programme that this government has imposed on local authorities. So he is wrong to say that local authorities have the power to do something different, because they simply don't. Contrast that, and this is where I'll give the government credit, contrast that with the flexibility offered by control areas, which is sensible. If councils don't want to use the powers or only wish to apply them in a small part of their council area, they've got exactly the power to do just that. We support the use of the control areas to cap the numbers of short-term lets where numbers are already too high. I favour action to control the numbers because I'm opposed to heavy-handed national control measures. Those are necessary, but it's important to have something that's appropriate for every council area. And we need a package of measures that includes second homes. And I'm far from convinced that the measures that the government has proposed so far in terms of council tax will provide sufficient deterrent for the second homes. Because in parts of the east of Fife, the number of second homes is far greater than the number of short-term lets. So we do need to have a rounded policy. But returning to the central point of today's motion, the licensing scheme, it is too heavy-handed. And I would urge, I would plead with the government, somebody who agrees with many of the arguments that the Minister has put forward today, I agree with them on those measures. I just plead with them. I have a real fear about what he's going to do to the tourism industry. If he gets the balance wrong, we will have an economic hit that will damage our country. And I think the Minister knows that's exactly what is going to happen. So I would urge him, even at this late stage, to pause, to reflect, 
to come up with something that is much more sensible, that empowers local councils to make the right decisions for their communities. Thank you, Mr Rennie. And I now call Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I do ask uh, members a slight forbearance. I wasn't anticipating speaking at this point in debate, but given the technical difficulties, uh, I will rise to move the amendment in Mark Griffin's uh, name. But I think already in this debate, I think we uh, uh, I think have got to the nub of the issue. There's a great number of euphemisms that have used. The, the broad brushstroke that this legislation uh, has uh, brought rather than nuance, the sledgehammer to crack the nut, but I think it's probably best put like this. We had an issue that we need to tackle in terms of Airbnbs. What we didn't need to do was tackle B&Bs, but that's precisely what these measures do. But I think it's also really important to, to deal with the nuance here, because actually already in the debate, we've had the deliberate confusion between the, the numbers and concentrations, which absolutely we need to tackle, and the standards issue, which was tackled by the licensing. And let's be clear, this debate, this motion is talking about licensing, not the planning applications. Licensing is incapable of tackling the number, and certainly not explicitly. Now, if the government's intention is to tackle the number through licensing, then it needs to be much more explicit about that. But unfortunately, what it has done is, a, is attempting to tackle this issue obliquely, and, a, a, and as a result, is doing so clumsily. Um, so, uh, uh, I think critically, we, we need to uh, recognise that this is a licensing approach that is tackling every part of the country when we have specific issues in specific parts of this country. And quite simply, I believe that the Scottish Government is washing its hands of the consequences and impact of this because we didn't need to bear down on B&B. It's already a highly regulated uh, part of the sector, having to comply with a great number of, of regulations. We had no need to tackle house swaps. We had no need to tackle people uh, letting individual rooms within their houses. And if Paul McLennan was to ask the City of Edinburgh Council about the issues, and were, they absolutely required the need uh, or required the ability to tackle the number, but if you talk to them, the issues they have is exactly in the issues that I've just raised. They have no ability to flex. I will take Ben McPherson in just a moment. No ability to flex around those key points because the City of Edinburgh Council recognises the need to have a, a room letting and house swaps as part of our offer, and they absolutely need the ability to achieve a balance through this legislation. But this essentially is a broad brushstroke and allows, uh, uh, doesn't allow them to achieve that balance that's so badly uh, needed in this city, which depends on the tourist industry. Happy to... Uh, ben take, uh, ben I thank Daniel Johnson for taking intervention, and I'm glad he's in agreement that because of certain circumstances, home letting and home sharing were right to include in the regulations. But does he agree with me that continued engagement between the Scottish Government and the City of Edinburgh Council, who've uh, made certain choices in the application of these regulations, uh, can Continued constructive engagement is required in order to make sure that the six-week exemption that is available works and works practically. Dan Johnson. Indeed, I would agree with that. I think there are also other areas that the city could look at, just in terms of the way that the pricing structure works and the application process. And indeed, I've encouraged uh, Cami Day uh, and others in the council to meet with uh, representatives from the sector to go through those sorts of issues. But I think that's absolutely what we need to do. But I think overall, I, I, I would say that there is a, a real issue with the way that the, the government has, a, has approached this. You cannot treat all businesses as though they are large multinational corporations because there's a very real human impact and consequence to this. And I held a meeting with many uh, uh, members of uh, the, 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 the sector just in the last few weeks, and it was harrowing. There were tears shed. People who have invested their life savings, whose pensions are the, the businesses that they run. And that's the reality. And I think all too often, not just in terms of this debate, but as someone coming from a small business background, we treat all businesses the same. But small businesses are people. And regardless of whether or not we, we think that there should be more or less, we needed to recognize about that there are individuals standing behind many of these businesses and that it has very real consequences. Now, this was going to be a difficult decision. This was going to have difficult consequences for many people because ultimately part of what we were saying is that we needed less of a particular kind of business. But ultimately, the government here has created a cliff edge. 
It hasn't done the work that it needed to do. I don't think it provided the guidance that local authorities needed. We wouldn't see the problems in the application process, the kind of complexities being raised in terms of confusion, whether or not floor plans were needed, the vast range in terms of fees applied. If the government had had clear guidance, we wouldn't have that level of variation and confusion. And likewise, if they had done their job properly and communicated effectively, we wouldn't have B&B &B owners unaware that they have to apply for a license in order to continue running the business. And I am very concerned that there are businesses in this city who, after October the 1st, will be operating illegally simply because they do not know. And I think the government really needs to think quite long and hard on that. Now, ultimately, the government has said that it wants to have a reset. I'm, I'm in my very last minute its relationship with business. And I would say to them that reset with business goes far beyond simply having more coffees or cocktails and canapes with big business. It's about having a different relationship, engagement with small business, understanding that small businesses are people. And frankly, their behaviour in this uh, regard, in this policy area, shows that they simply have not learned that lesson. That reset has yet to begin for many small businesses up and down this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Uh, we now move to the open part of the debate. I call uh, Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thinking about the role of short-term lets in my own constituency in the Scottish Borders, it's clear to me that today's debate could so easily have been a celebration of the contribution yeah, yeah. of this industry that it makes to our rural economy. But for a rural area like the Borders, the Scottish Government's short-term let licensing scheme is a square peg for a round hole. It's misguided, it's questionably legal, illegal, it's anti-business, it's a government wheeze that's trying to fix and solve issues that they have created over 16 years of mismanagement. My colleagues will no doubt have more to say on the devastating impact of these plans in our cities and other parts of Scotland, but I'm clear from the conversations that I've had with my constituents that these plans simply cannot be allowed to progress. Yeah, yeah. Forming... Well, OK. Minister Richard Lockett. Well, thanks to the member for giving way, and she did make the comment this is anti-business, and I'd like to probe that with her for a second or two. As a business minister, I go around the country, and one of the messages I consistently get from businesses is they can't find accommodation for key workers. Yeah particularly in our cities, but also in particular rural areas of the country as well. Therefore, is it not perhaps helping business if we address the housing situation in our cities in rural Scotland so that our businesses can be more productive and get their staff? Richard Hamilton. Presiding officer, I thought Richard Lockhead understood business. I was actually quite respectful of his knowledge of business experience, but this is just showing that he has absolutely no idea of the consequences. Forming an increasingly important part of tourism sector, short-term lets directly support almost 10,000 jobs across the country, hundreds of which can be found in the borders. But the real impact of self-catering businesses goes much further than that, providing a base for people to stay and explore our towns, our villages and our remote rural areas, brings benefit to local businesses, to butchers, to bakers, to artists, to coffee shops on our challenged high streets. Yep. It can also place tourists right on the doorstep of the border's biggest attractions or Scotland's biggest attractions, whether they're walking um, in the Eildons, fishing in the Tweed or exploring the beautiful abbeys. The economic contribution of people visiting Scotland and staying in short-term lets is set to surpass £1 billion per year within the next decade. And that is £1 billion of opportunity for local businesses and the people whose jobs they support. When I'm visiting these businesses in the borders that operate short-term lets, I'm always struck by how conscious they are about supporting their local economy. And on a recent visit to Benkin Cottages near Jebra, which is an agritourism enterprise, and I welcome Caroline Miller to the gallery today, that has allowed local farmers to put their businesses on a more sustainable footing. And I could see firsthand how businesses were able to work together to create uh, local jobs, local people, and boost their local economy. And they were so proud about this. Behind all these fantastic businesses are fantastic people. In most cases, 70%, in fact, are women. And I want to take this opportunity and time to talk about their role in this. And I was recently 
con uh, contacted by Ms Macdonald, a constituent who operates a short-term let business in the borders. She described the government's licensing policy proposals as badly drafted postcode lottery. She goes on to say that regulations vary wildly from council to council, often with very little logic, as to why one council would have one rule in place and another not. She has warned... Yes, if you can tell me what's happening within ben the Ben McPherson? I, I would just be interested in Rachel Hamilton's thoughts. Uh, Many occasions, uh, Conservative MSPs have argued that local authorities should have more discretion on certain matters. Uh, is Rachel Hamilton arguing in this instance that the government should prescribe uh, to a greater extent what local authorities can and cannot do? Rachel Hamilton? Well, Ben McPherson's um, point is, is flawed because local authorities um, have the option to bring forward legislation if they want it, when it comes to a short-term let control zone. But in this situation, every local authority is adopting different approaches, which is totally confusing. It adds to the bureaucracy, adds to the red tape, adds to the expense. And I'll, I'll give you an example. No, because I need to make progress. But I'll give you an example. A local constituent is, uh, is investing in, in three short-term let properties because he lives in a rural area has got planning, one of the conditions of the planning is that he cannot, until he gets his licence, bring in any income, and that's going to take nine months. Um, how, what, what does that look like for local employment? What does that look like for his bank interest loan? I just think you need to reflect very carefully about what you are doing to the local economy, what your government, I'm sorry, is doing to the local economy. Ms Macdonald went on to say that she's heard of many home sharers and B&B &B operators around the borders that they no longer wish to continue to operate after the 1st of October and her mother-in-law is one of them. Another woman falling foul to this government's inability to support women in business. Yep. Another, another borderer has been in touch with me, Avril, who won, runs a fantastic countryside retreat near Melrose. She's expressed identical concerns about the needless red tape, the cost of these plans that are bringing operators in the borders, uh, affecting operators in the borders, and warning it will lead to substantial job losses and a decline of businesses that rely on tourism. And she's clear that the government must pause this legislation. Um, just to conclude, presiding officer, we know this government don't know how to listen to businesses. They know that they cannot engage with coastal communities. We've had the equivalent of the potential Highland clearances. Ms. Hamilton, could H you please H bring your mic to close? Thank you. Thank you, presiding officer. All I would say is to make policy work, you have to listen to people. Yeah, to create legislation, you have to engage with industry. Let's pause, let's reset, let's review. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. I now call Kevin Stewart to be followed by Brian Whitto. Mr Stewart. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And may I first and foremost say uh, that I recognise how important uh, the tourist industry is to Scotland. But equally, I also recognise that Scotland is home, uh, called home by people and communities, and that many have been adversely impacted by the enormous growth in short-term letting over the last decade. And that's not just in the cities, it's not just party flats as um, Mr Fraser described them, but I remember Christine Graham on an occasion talking about a difficulty there was uh, with a light in her area. I don't know if that was in the Midlothian south part of our constituency or the borders part, but I'm sure we'll hear that. So this is not just a city difficulty, uh, and some of the difficulties that there are are different in different areas, and that is why we have taken the action that we did. We, we did. It is deeply disappointing um, that uh, extreme language and misinformation around short-term lets licensing has been encouraged by public figures, Tory and Labour, and that a great amount of flip-flopping has gone on over this issue in recent times. And uh, uh, let me make a wee bit of progress and I'll take you in, Mr Kerr. Uh, as a, a former housing minister, um, I engaged with stakeholder bodies, community groups and many, many MSPs on this issue. Uh, my se successors have done likewise, and the government has spent a large amount of time listening to the various viewpoints and has done everything to strike the right balance. And I'm going to be interested to hear the speeches of some colleagues today and to see how their views have changed over the piece, as I think many who were vociferous for change uh, have now changed their minds 
for political expediency. And I'll take Mr Kerr. Liam Kerr. I'm very grateful. The member is absolutely right to talk about the need for accurate information. So I wonder, given the need to be sure of the impact of this scheme on the ground, does the member know how many people and businesses will be required to apply for a licence in his Aberdeen constituency? Kevin Stewart. Um, I don't have that figures to hand, but all of this work was done uh, at the beginning and as part of the, the BRIA, as, as always the case when legislation is brought forward. Um, I, I think I should also say that as well as um, politicians changing their minds, others also seem to have changed their minds. Uh, and as the former minister, some people in the sector told me that they were not in favour of a licensing scheme, but instead wanted a registration scheme. Now, some of these same folk are saying that they want a licensing scheme, just, just not this one. Uh, I've heard folks say, we want something similar to the proposed Welsh scheme. Well, I have news for them. Uh, the Welsh scheme is largely based on the Scottish model, uh, and they have developed it in the 22 months since the, this Parliament uh, passed uh, its licensing regulations. I will give way very briefly to Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr Stewart, if your analysis is correct, why is there such a huge outcry from the hospitality and tourist sector that is telling you that this is wrong? Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to speak I, I through the chair. Mr Stewart. Right across uh, the period of time that this has taken place, there have been many folks who have wanted no regulation whatsoever. I go back to my previous comment. Many folk wanted a registration scheme. That would have not have resolved some of the difficulties uh, that we face. And I'm concentrating on licensing today. I'm not going to cover the planning uh, aspects of this, but, you know, to any great degree. But... Uh, we've taken the right decisions, bringing the licensing and planning together, and to allow local authorities to make their own choices. The government also allowed uh, a six-month uh, extension at the request of operators, but now it seems that others in this place and some industry stakeholders want even more time. And that's another case of kicking the ball into the long grass. And over this time period, people and communities across this country who have been impacted badly, uh, uh, impacted by badly run short-term lets, continue to feel that they are not being listened to and that they are being ignored. There is scant uh, uh, or no mention of them in the Conservative motion and the Labour and Liberal Democrat uh, amendments that are before us today. Um, and yet I'm sure that some of the same opposition MSPs who were urging the Scottish Government to take ur urgent action way back to alleviate the difficulties that their constituents and their communities were facing will stand up today and support further dither and delay, ignoring those folks that they cited pre previously were in deep distress. And I'll take Mr Johnson. Briefly, Daniel Johnson. As someone that did argue for control, would you not accept that many of us find ourselves difficult, have difficulty supporting something that takes in home swaps and individual room letting, and, and it's that scope that's the problem for many people? Would you not accept that, that that's a valid... Kevin Stewart, I will, come, I will come to that point in, uh, uh, in my Mr. speech. Mr Stewart, you will need to do so quite quickly. Because I, I, you're running I will do time. so as quickly as I possibly can. Um, we recognise that there are different solutions required in different areas of the country, and that is why we have given the flexibility that we have to local gov government. Um, President officer, let me turn to safety, because this is the part of the licensing scheme that does apply to all. And it puts Scotland's tourism sector on a level, high-quality playing field. Guests in the Scottish tourist destinations will have, have the confidence and assurance that their accommodation is safe and meets a high standard, whether they are staying in a hotel, a traditional bed and breakfast, or a short-term let. The fit and proper person test is designed to protect neighbours, guests, and other people from harm and crime, and to assist Mr. Stewart, you will need uh, to in, in law enforcement. And finally, um, President Officer, ensuring that a property meets the mandatory conditions, such as the repairing standard and fire safety requirements, Mr. is only right. Mr. Stewart, Who please conclude. can argue against that? Thank you, Mr. Stewart. I now call Brian Whittle to be followed by Ben McPherson. Mr. Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I do welcome the opportunity to speak 
in this short-term Let's Debate and to bring the significant concerns to the Chamber from across the tourism industry and the rural economy. If only this was an isolated SNP green policy having such a devastating impact on our tourism industry and rural economy. Rural policies and tourism policies de developed far too often by urban MSPs with no understanding nor interest in the practical application and outcomes of their policies. Yeah. It is obvious from watching Patrick Harvey's performance in local government committee yesterday that he has just a fundamental dislike for private landlords yeah. Yeah. and he cares not a jot about the fallout to the industry for the people and the businesses across Scotland as long as he gets to punish the private rental sector. Yeah. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, this STL legislation comes on top of the Scottish Government's temporary rent control policy and cap on rent rises. And I say temporarily, advisedly, as it was brought in during COVID restrictions, but once in place, Patrick Harvey has led the Greens and the SNP to keep it in place. The problem is, Deputy Presiding Officer, as we know, the Greens and increasingly the SNP do not engage with reality, let alone businesses resulting in legislation that has caused huge rent rises chronic shortages of rental properties, especially for university students, a rise in homelessness and children in temporary accommodation, and a delay in building affordable homes for rent, exactly the opposite of what it was intended to do. So whether it's a seaside bed and breakfast owner in North Berwick, or a farmer renting out holiday cottages in Ayrshire, they'll now have to consider if the added complication and costs associated with this scheme are worth the effort. Now, the ability to grant temporary exemptions for major events is at least a recognition that these events should be supported. But from the discussions I've had with those behind major sporting events, the current approach is bringing little comfort. Take the Open Championship as a prime example. This major golf tournament regularly brings tens of millions of pounds to the local economy. Next year, it's due to be in Troon, bringing tens and thousands of visitors to the area. Short-term lets are crucial to there being enough affordable accommodation in the area. Now, while South, if I could just finish the, finish the point, I'll, I'll, I'll take Ben's, uh, Ben's uh, sorry, my member's intervention. Now, while South Ayrshire Council have stated they will grant temporary licences for the period of the event, the added cost and regulatory burden on homeowners for something they might only do once every decade may well make it not worth the effort. That means fewer properties available for those wanting to stay and higher prices for remaining accommodation. For events like the Open, this scheme risks making Scotland, the home of golf, a less attractive prospect to host its greatest championship. And for events like the Edinburgh Festival and the Fringe, so uniquely tied to the city, it threatens their continued existence. I'll give away ben McPherson. To Mr McPherson. Uh, thank the member. I agree with the member that making the temporary exemptions practical and, and workable is, is a really important consideration. Does he agree with me, though, that we should all be concerned about the very high levels and charges that some who own properties um, go to market with at these events, whether it's COP, major sporting events. Isn't it a collective uh, challenge for all of us to, Brian, to think it? about? The other option is we don't have any accommodation at all. Absolutely. You know, and, 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 that, and that's the problem with this legislation is legislation going to do. We're going to have much less, uh, much less properties available, so the actual cost of the accommodation will go up. Yeah. Deputy Presiding Officer, there's simply no way that the Scottish Government can stand there and say that this scheme is the best and the right one and it's ready to go. As Paul McLennan said in his opening statement there, he wrote to the MSPs and in one paragraph asking and encouraging us to host, uh, encourage hosts to sign up to the scheme and the next paragraph telling us he was planning further changes. Yeah. If a meal is ready, Deputy Presiding Officer, you generally don't need to change the recipe after it's served. Yeah. The Scottish Government's approach to policy is increasingly driven by the so-called sunk cost fallacy, being unwilling to abandon a course of action because they have, um, they have heavily invested in it, Absolutely. long after it has become uh, clear that the, changing the members course in his last 40 be far seconds, more beneficial. What the Scottish Government should be doing is working with the sector to develop workable regulation, but the scheme the Scottish Government is attempting to drive through risks driving countless numbers of small operators out of business, damage the tourism sector and penalise the many for the actions of the few. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government needs to change course, pause this scheme and work with providers to create a system that properly recognises the diversity and range of short-term lets across Scotland. If they choose not to, then they will have no one but themselves to blame for sinking Scotland's tourism sector. Deputy Presiding Officer.
Thank you, Mr Whittle. I now call Ben McPherson to be followed by Sarah Boyer. Mr McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. And I think it's excellent that we have this time to discuss this complex and important issue. From the outset, I want to make clear that as an Edinburgh MSP, I've seen and heard firsthand for a long time the impact that significant growth in the short-term let market can have on local communities. Similarly, I recognise the valuable contribution that tourism makes to my constituency, our capital city and Scotland's economy more widely. That is why in recent weeks and over years, I've met with a variety of stakeholders representing different perspectives, from living rent on the one hand to short-term let operators and owners on the other. However, most of all, I've listened to my constituents. I appreciate that there are highly respectable, very um, effective managers and owners of short-term lets, and they do produce employment in local economies. But even before I was first elected in 2016, I was hearing consistently from many, many people, in Leith in particular, about how a very large amount of poorly managed short-term lets in their tenements and their streets were causing them disruption, discomfort and dilapidation of common property. Plus, I've heard concerns about how the increasing flow of properties moving out of the market in terms of being able to be purchased by, for example, first-time buyers and from the private rented sector into the short-term let market being repurposed as whole property, otherwise known as secondary short-term lets. And I've heard from many who feel that it's been unjust that private rented sector landlords and other visitor accommodation providers, like local hotels, have until recently been held to a higher standard than those short-term letting properties that aren't their primary residence in particular. Yep, briefly. Chairman Balfour. Uh, I'm grateful to remember. Uh, we remember, except within his argument, that if someone is renting out a room in their house, why should they be affected by these regulations? Because they're still living in that property and they're still just helping somebody else out in regard to that way. Ben so I'll come to the temporary exemption shortly, uh, but also, uh, actually, home letting and home sharing is right to be included because there are some very successful businesses who have several rooms in their house that they rent out, but they still live in it. And it's right that those rooms are held to the same standard of regulation and safety as other accommodation providers. So, in previous years, constituents of mine and others with concerns felt that they were not being adequately considered by authorities and that little could be done to hold short-term let operators to account. And that is why I pressed the Scottish Government to take action to regulate short-term lets for a long time. And I did so with Councillor Kate Campbell, Councillor Adam McVeigh, Tommy Shepherd MP, Deirdre Bocker MP, uh, and others like uh, Andy Whiteman MSP, for example, and, and even some who who've, who've, uh, are sitting on the benches that are going to oppose the scheme today. And it's always been clear to me that the regulation of the short-term let sector is required to ensure that properties are safe and responsibly managed. This has been long overdue and it's also becoming the norm internationally because we should be mindful that places have already taken steps to regulate the short-term let sector in light of the same issues that we are discussing today, whether that's Copenhagen, Paris, Barcelona and most recently New York. These are just a few examples. We are an outlier here in Scotland, or have been until recently, so arguably we're playing catch-up. And it was almost six years later from raising concerns on behalf of my constituents that this Parliament voted quite some time ago now in January 2022 to introduce regulations that are proportionate and necessary to create the licensing scheme, which facilitates national standards and also provides some local flexibility for councils. The regulations create the licensing scheme to ensure safety, uh, to set appropriate quality standards and to hold hosts accountable in line with other providers of tourist accommodation uh, and more in line with the private rented sector. And uh, together with the short-term let planning control areas where adopted, like here in Edinburgh, going forward the Scottish Government's actions will help to ease the housing crisis, which uh, is particularly acute here in Edinburgh, as I've argued on several occasions and will and continue to do so. So it's right the Scottish Government has been proactive in, in the policies it's adopted to tackle the housing crisis and this is part of the balance. 
My constituency is one of the most acute places where that housing crisis is being felt, whether it's people not being able to find affordable homes in their local community or close to their family or their place of work or their children's school. But my constituency also happens to be home to a large share of Edinburgh's holiday accommodation. And while I recognise that tackling the affordable housing crisis uh, requires a multi-pronged approach, and people are right to argue that, going forward, lo local aspirations are that the licensing scheme and the control area will mean that more of our stock is lived in all year round. And that's the right thing to the do. The members in his last 30 seconds. I want to conclude by saying I'm sympathetic to concerns raised by the culture sector in Edinburgh about accommodation, accommodation capacity during the summer festival season uh, and the spike in demand that we see. And that is why I've engaged constructively with the government and with the council about making sure that the power to grant ex temporary exemptions uh, for up to six weeks is able to be utilised uh, in a reasonably simple, straightforward and inexpensive way. And I look forward to seeing continued engagement on that. Uh, this is a really important issue, presiding officer, in terms of the wider considerations in our country about over-tourism. Um, Short-term lets have been part of that community concern. The government is right to take action and to continue to consider how we get the balance right. Thank you, Mr McPherson. I call Sarah Boyack to be followed by Jamie Green. Ms Boyack. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Uh, first of all, I want to declare my register of interest with my former employment at the Scottish Federation of Housing Association. Since I came back to the Parliament, though, I've been engaged in this issue in very great detail. Um, I was on the committee that looked at the principle of this issue, and I was also involved in looking at the detail. And for me, Edinburgh has a long-standing housing crisis, which has been getting worse. Not enough homes, the lowest percentage of social housing in Scotland, and increasingly more expensive, both private rented and buying homes, much more expensive than the rest of Scotland, and a huge lack of affordable accommodation for students as well, 20% of our population. And at the same time, we have a successful, growing city where tourism and culture are a key part of our identity and our economy. But the challenge there is partly that lack of new housing being built to meet demand, a massive shortage during the summer when the festivals are on. But there's also a key issue because we have lost so many properties to short-term lets. The estimate in the 2019 research which was published said that around 13,500 homes had been lost to short-term lets, totally unregulated. And although we had had planning policies in the city since 2011, that planning guidance had not worked which is why we urgently needed the powers of the new short-term let control area with the planning capacity for our council to have the powers. Because you can see the impact that unregulated um, and uncontrolled short-term lets have had, particularly in the city centre, where you can see communities being hollowed out, and you can see residents who've suffered from the expansion of party flats and the pressures that brought to many of our tenements, in particular because they didn't know who those uh, flats were owned by. So when the Scottish Government agreed to act on uh, enabling authorities who wanted to address local challenges, I welcomed that because having a combination approach where we tackle our housing shortage, where we regulated and, plan and had used planning powers in short-term lets and enabled local communities to rent out their flats during the summer when they were on holiday or they were still in the flats, I thought that was a win-win. But the problem was, and it's been said by several colleagues today, um, the SNP proposals that came in front of us didn't strike the right balance. First of all, they didn't listen to the arguments about the difference between on the balance, absolutely. Minister. Thank you for that. And, and, and I think that you know, we're talking about the debate, and there has to be a balance. And I want to ask the Boyack's, I suppose, view on the statement that was announced by the Coburn Association, by Place, by Newtown and Broughton Community Council, by Living Rent and Edinburgh Old Town Association. Communities support the view the new, uh, new short-term let regulations. I don't know what your response is in terms. You've obviously seen the response to that as well. But what your response is and to the points that they make? Absolutely, because they are desperate to get action in short-term lets, and the key issue is that loss of 13,500 properties. That's what the short-term can let control area is critical for, and the planning powers. 
The, the other side, though, is the fact that long established, if the Minister would take the uh, courtesy of listening to me, long established bed and breakfast operators who have been in the city for decades, who are not part of that loss of housing, were also going to be regulated and had to be licensed. Don't see the point of that. It's not an either or. There's an issue about the balance of the regulations which the previous Minister had. No, no, I've, I've brought along my uh, contributions of the previous Minister on many occasions before. They were not listen to. We have a problem in that unregulated short-term lets um, need to be acted upon, but we've also got the problem that it's reached out far more than people wanted. And the fact that the SNP decided to roll out the requirement to register across the entire country was completely against the arguments we were making in key communities, where we wanted our councils to have the powers to act in places like Edinburgh and the Highlands, where the impact of Airbnbs and short-term lets have had a major impact on our housing shortages and as I would say to the Minister who is interested in workers, the fact that we have now got people in Edinburgh having to leave the city because there are no longer homes for them to live in. So we have seen the impact of that misguided approach. So we need a different approach. Our housing crisis has not been addressed and the, house, the Council is put in the tr process of trying to make progress with its short-term let control area across the city, but without the flexibility that was part of the ambition for that legislation in the first place. And that's a point, no thank you, I've already taken intervention. That was a point that Ben McPherson rightly made about people sh sharing their accommodation during the summer when they're still there or renting it out when they're on holiday for a couple of weeks during the festival. Fundamentally, we need both investment investment in new housing and effective short-term let controls and appropriate, appropriate legislation to make sure that we're not over legislating, which is what you've got with traditional bed and breakfast now. And that is leading to more expensive housing, whether to rent or buy, and it's increasing homeless rates. So we have a major problem. It needs to be addressed. All of my constituents are being let down. I've had something like 70 or 80 um, emails in the last few days against removing the powers in terms of tackling short-term lets. That is not what we're arguing today. We're arguing about the points of the impact on tourism because of the way that the regulations are being implemented, nationally mandated, implemented locally, regardless of whether it's needed or without the flexibility that different local authorities clearly want. So the Minister said that he'd make changes. I'd like to hear in his closing remarks what those would be. We know that after the 1st of October, if the Minister's plans go ahead, people who are not registered under the current regulations will be fined potentially £2,500. So that has been clear. But there's a conflict here between a licensing scheme that includes traditional bed and breakfast and the the pressure that's on councils who want to get going on their short-term let control areas to tackle the short-term let problem. We do have responsible owners who rent out all or part of their property and help their neighbours with repairs Ms. and maintenance Boyack, could you please and waste conclude? management. But not all of them do, and that's the target we need. We need to act now. We're in the worst of all worlds. More centralisation bureaucracy and not the action to tackle the housing crisis that is getting worse for my constituents. Thank you, Ms. Boyack. I now call Jamie Green. Min Minister, please, we, we don't make sedentary remarks. We are on our feet or we don't make remarks. Um, I call Jamie Green to be followed by Christine Green. Mr. Green. Right, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I first make the glaring observation about how empty the middle benches are today? And doesn't that just sum up the fingers in the ear approach that so many MSPs are taking to the really important issue? that we are debating today. Much, of course, has already been said, and members who know me will know that I'm not in the habit of opposing for opposing sake. So I want to make two valid points today, because my inbox, like many others in this chamber, has been absolutely flooded over the last couple of weeks about this issue. The first point I want to make is this. I understand the need to properly regulate the property rental market. Anybody with a flat in Edinburgh will not be immune to the very many issues that have risen with the rapid expansion of holiday lets, something that Mr McPherson, I think, quite eloquently alluded to. I understand the challenges that that has brought. I think we all do. The effect on the wide, wider housing market and stock, the horror stories of dodgy HMOs, unscrupulous landlords, stag parties making life absolute hell for their neighbours. 
We understand all of that. Neither are we blind to the wider housing problems that Scotland faces, problems that this government, interestingly, could have fixed a long time ago. The affordable home shortage, for example, rising rental costs driven by a huge mismatch of supply and demand. The question that we've been asked to answer, though, is that if this nationwide short-term licensing scheme will fix any of that. And I actually believe that the majority of small guest house owners, B&Bs, holiday lets, cottage, cottage industry farmers, short-term rental owners, I think they get it too. They understand perfectly well the need for regulation where it is appropriate, and none of the correspondence that I've had disputes that. Which is my second point. The overwhelming feedback from our tourism sector is that this one-size-fits-all approach is as wrong as it is unfair. Yep. Because what is a problem in Edinburgh is not necessarily a problem, is not necessarily on a problem on Cumbria. Because the way to solve a housing shortage is not simply to restrict holiday lets. The way to solve problematic Airbnb rentals is not to hammer people trying to rent out their spare room. It is better to enforce antisocial behaviour using powers that already exist. Because overall, the message that we're getting, we cannot ignore, is that the solution to urban problems cannot and should not come at the expense of rural or island communities. I've got a lot to get through. If industry estimates are accurate, and if the figure is true, and I don't know the figure, but if up to 80% of current operators have not applied for a new licence, surely the government must be scratching its head and asking itself, why not? Because we are. My inbox, like everybody else's, tells us the truth and the reality. These new rules are overly cumbersome, they might be expensive to some, and even in the case of finding local tradespeople to prove compliance, it's proving unachievable and impossible in some areas. Worse than that, presiding officer, we are already being told that we are seeing businesses turn one against another. Those who have applied for a license are taking umbrage with those who have not. We've all had the same email about some extreme cases of that. They are rightly questioning us why existing measures which govern the health and safety of property are not good enough. And it does beg the question, I have to ask, why government waited 16 years to do something about it if it had any concerns up until now. And it does beg the question why short-term control areas aren't good enough to deal with those localised issues. Look, I don't know what will happen next after the 1st of October, but if it's true, if holiday houses are sold off to private buyers, if many will lie there sitting empty on our island communities instead of drawing in much needed visitors, if some small businesses decide just to shut up shop and give in and close down, if students are struggling to get rental rooms because property owners don't want to go through the hassle of getting a license simply to rent out a spare room to help pay the bills. We have no idea if pet sitting or house sitting or house swapping will all too be caught up in all of this. There are far too many questions and I'm afraid far too many answers from the front bench, yet we're just two weeks away from the deadline, the so-called cliff edge. Regulation, in my view, of any sector should be there to help that industry, not to harm it. But as too often is the case in here, we make laws as a knee-jerk reaction because we're not enforcing existing regulations rather than a lack of effective new legislation. Much has been said about this reset with business. The way to reset with business is to listen to them. Don't listen to us. Don't listen to anybody in this room. Listen to people in the gallery. And listen to real business owners. Listen to Helena, who owns Ashley Farm Cottages on the Isle of Arran, who said, please, pause, reflect, and review. Get around the table and negotiate with our industry. I say to Helena, I will vote to save your industry today. Let's see how your own MSP votes, notably absent, I should add, because they will have you to answer to. Thank you. And I call Christine Graham to be followed by Sue Weber. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, first, I very much welcome licensing of Airbnbs. In my neck of the woods, there are many, no doubt, some excellent. But one in particular drove me to distraction, as every summer midweek night, like clockwork, as night fell, the temporary inhabitants would set up their drinks table, barbecue, and later a gazebo in their garden. I had prayed for rain to drive them indoors, not a gazebo. As the night and drinking progressed, so did the noise levels. Finally, one very late night, indeed early morning, had enough, opened the bedroom window and proclaimed that I was a neurosurgeon, needing my sleep, and they should all go to bed. Silence fell, then there were whispers, and peace reigned. The gazebo abandoned. 
So better legislation than neighbours having to resort to such subterfuge. I would add that this is not only an urban problem, having had issues with a so-called party house in West Linton re referenced earlier. I also broadly support and appreciate the health and safety requirements. However, I was surprised at the reach of the legislation and have some case studies which illustrate some issues constituents have raised. I put these on the record and it may be that in summing up, some of these can be addressed by the Minister. Now, I do appreciate that Midlothian and Scottish Borders Council have issued policy guidance introducing some limited flexibility, such as temporary exemptions, for example, to accommodate a large influx of visitors over a short period to support specific events such as local festivals and sports events such as the Melrose Sevens. These do require to go before fire and rescue and police, but there is also the opportunity for temporary licences, for example, when the property concerned is subject to sale. These have been referred to as light touch. But to constituents' concerns, these are in quotes and abridged, and their constituents' words, not mine, but I, I think it's part of my job to bring them to the chamber. Quotes, I thought I'd get in touch with you to explain why the short-term li li licensing is terrible and in desperate need of adjusting to allow flexibility. I'm going through a very expensive divorce and desperately trying to sell both my family home and my one-bed flat in Edinburgh. My flat lies empty because I cannot rent it out as a holiday let, which I've done without complaint for 15 years. Um, would I do this when it's on the market? Would I apply for a licence? Now, I've already referred to the fact you can get temporary positions uh, from Borders Council and Midlothian. I don't know if that's the case in Edinburgh. Close quotes. Case two. I've operated our family flat in Cosby side of a, as a short-term let since 2006, once our children no longer needed accommodation for the university years. There are some party flats in Edinburgh which should be easy to identify because of the number of guests and number of rooms. Could this be a straightforward solution? I've applied for a certificate of lawfulness and I'm in the process of applying for a licence to enable me to continue with my work. This has all taken many hours and is likely to cost me my entire profit for this year. I just have to hope it's worth it. Close quotes. Case study three. Quotes, I'm writing to you as a host of self-catering cabins based in Peebles and in hope that this will assist in the calls to the Scottish Government to pause the implementation of the short-term legislation deadline. The application process is cumbersome, bureaucratic, expensive and unnecessary with time quickly running out as the 1st October deadline approaches. Close quotes. Number four. Quotes, we have a purpose-built one-bed conversion specifically designed for short-term lets and not suitable for long-term occupancy because of lack of storage. We mark it through country cottages, which insist on all the safety checks in the current legislation without the additional costs and hoops in the new registration. And finally, number four, home swapping. Quotes, we have been members of HomeLink for approximately four years, during which we have undertaken 10 home exchanges. This involves staying in each other's home in order to have a holiday, usually on a simultaneous basis, occasionally non-simultaneous. The exchanges are undertaken on a trust basis between partners, no money changes hands, nor is there any payment in kind made. These are not commercial arrangements, but part of the circular or sharing economy. On average, we'll probably do three exchanges a year. Some people do two exchanges. We must emphasize these exchanges happen in our private home without charge, our home complies with all the safety standards required by legislation and as it, where we permanently live, we maintain it to a high standard. Close quotes. And these are for constituents. I put them out there for consideration. Now, I share the... Con I'm just concluding, sorry. I, I share the concerns of Willie Rennie. I don't know if he's happy I share his concerns. But there is insufficient flexibility in the regulations which tightly define which properties fall within the remit. I think we're all agreed we need regulations, but the actual, if you go through the list defined in the regulations, there's no flexibility to councils. They're very tight, and I don't think they're always suitable to local communities. And I know councils have their areas, whatever their political hue, at heart. So I therefore trust that the Scottish Government will, as this regulatory framework is applied, if necessary, if what we are saying, some of us, comes to pass, undertake a review and allow councils more flexibility in which properties are affected. Please don't heckle me. I'm trying to be non-political and reasonable, which is unusual for you, Mr Ross. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And I call Sue Webber to be followed by Alistair Allen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to have the chance to speak in this debate this afternoon. It is, after all, extremely important. And five minutes is not enough time to do justice to everyone who has contacted me to raise their concerns about this legislation. Uh, many of the stories I've heard are resonate and are reflective of some we've just heard from uh, my colleague across the chamber, Christine Graham. I will speak to a few, but I would like to thank everyone who has contacted me and to reassure you that I have been listening to what you've been saying. As my colleague Murdo Fraser said, the tourist sector is vitally important for Scotland, yet the SNP government are refusing to extend the 1st of October deadline for the licensing scheme on short-term lets, damaging one of Scotland's leading industries at a time when they are absolutely flummoxed and struggling already. And like every politically driven SNP green wheeze, the new licensing regime is not designed to encourage business or promote tourism. Last week, I joined the Self-Catering Scotland uh, gathering that was outside Parliament and spoke to lots of self-catering operators, many of whom were from the area in the Lothians I represent, and one in particular man who was from Edinburgh originally, who was disheartened that he is now being branded a parasite. How, does that make me how do you think that makes me feel, he said to me. How would that make you feel if that's how you were branded? He's never had any complaints of any of his short-term lets or his self-catering businesses. And I've received countless emails and phone calls from concerned constituents and of even paper copies of stuff that's coming through. Now, that's how disheartened and dejected the industry is feeling. An elderly gentleman contacted me to say that his wife's parents, when his wife's parents died, they left him the two-bedroom flat in Edinburgh's old town, which they used for short-term lets. His wife has unfortunately developed dementia and Alzheimer's and has a very little income. So the income that they do make from the rentals goes towards her very expensive care home fees. And he has said that being advised that he will not be granted a license in Edinburgh under the STL legislation, therefore the support for his disabled wife will end. Yes, I will. Minister. The person you mentioned actually applied in, in terms of that. You're saying they're not going to be granted a, a, a permission. Can, you, can I ask if they've not applied how that, that's, been, that's been arrived at? And I'm asking for more detail on that. It's a very complex position in Edinburgh. And no one I've heard from, they're all tearing their hair out with the, the complexity and the non-refundable nature of the entire process. And I am not going to take another intervention on this topic. This is a family whose wife is now in a very, very challenging personal situation. Social care in Edinburgh is bad enough, frankly. And I've also been contacted by the manager of the Neil McNeil Trust, a charity in Edinburgh, which provides self-catering accommodation free of charge for members of the Christian science community. She's concerned about how the legislation in its current form is affecting charities such as the one that she manages. And I gather she might be in the chamber today of an email that she subsequently sent me through this afternoon. And she said, we're not against regulation, as are we, but we are not against health and safety, but we need fair and just legislation and I am urgently calling on the Scottish Government for a pause in the implementation of the licensing legislation due to come into force on the 1st of October so that fair and just regulation, fair and just is a common theme, can be achieved by sitting down with stakeholders and getting it right. This is a clear example of how this one-size-fits-all policy is clearly unfit for purpose. And I've also been contacted by a constituent called Julian, who has given me permission to quote directly from his letter. Firstly, he said, I am writing as an ex-SNP member. I resigned my membership last month in disgust at the way the STL legislation has been handled and the absolute lack of interest that I've received from my local MSP, Angus Robertson, when I try to raise the issue with him. The current version of the STL legislation is a madness that has to be stopped. And I've also been contacted by Alison Burns, who for 30 years has been exchanging her home with visitors from across the globe, all without incident. The inclusion of this demonstrates an extreme lack of understanding of this community, she tells me. No money exchanges hands. We've already heard of the East Lothian constituent on that social media channel that I was also asked to join, and I was 
absolutely astounded for her to be told to go off and get a job and then go off and claim benefits. But we've heard the Minister's response to that. So in conclusion, Presiding Officer, it's not in anyone's interest to shield rogue operators and the sector believes in strong licensing is important, but it must be fair and practical, not deliberately onious. But predictably, the SNP Green Government has no desire to work with government or business, sorry, no desire to work with business to achieve reasonable outcomes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Presiding Officer, uh, tourists increasingly value self-catering accommodation as well as traditional B&Bs. So I begin today by recognising the vital role that they both have in our tourist economy. And I recognise, too, the calls from these sectors to make sure that the licensing regime is implemented in a way that is, is fair. It is worth noting that the sector is uh, certainly not anti-regulation, and judging by the previous comments on this matter, at least, neither were a number of parties in this chamber when this particular legislation was legislated on. Others have um, scrutinised from various positions and very effectively the detail of the legislation today, but I want to point to the context that lies around this legislation and to one question that often goes unasked or at least unheard in the debate around it, because the people affected often lack a voice. And that question is, where are people in some of our rural and island communities going to live in future? If we're to address that question honestly, then we will need to have some kind of a picture um, through licensing and other measures uh, of the number of properties currently changing from full-time dwellings into short-term lets. And like Willie Rennie, I, I could make a, a similar point about second homes, although I appreciate that is not within the scope of this legislation. Edinburgh, as we've heard from Mr McPherson, has well publicised challenges around short-term lets. Uh, but of course, these problems are faced in rural areas too. Indeed, it is no exaggeration to say that some communities are in the midst of a housing crisis. There has been a very welcome investment by the Scottish Government in new social housing over the past few years in my own Hebridean constituency. Yet I continue to receive very regular correspondence from younger people and families who struggle to find a house. In many places, people are simply being priced out of their own communities. And I cannot help but note that these are the same areas where there has been a massive proliferation of short-term lets. My constituency has one of the highest per capita rates of lets on Airbnb in the country. The number of registered self-catering properties is now well over twice what it was a decade ago. And I do not think that it is a coincidence that as the number of short-term lets has grown in that period, the number of privately rented properties in the Western Isles has dropped by a third. Organisations like the West Harris Trust have raised concerns about the viability of fragile communities, where the balance is increasingly swinging towards both second homes and short-term lets. Short-term lets should not be thought of the, as the only factor in this issue, but nor can they be excluded from the debate about it. Harris and other communities like it clearly and desperately need homes for people who live and work there full-time. A public meeting I attended recently in Harris successfully made a plea for more social housing in the island, but that's only one part of the answer. Any hope we have in staving off a demographic crisis in communities like this lies in attracting people to live and work there. That cannot happen if people cannot find any house to rent or if they are continually and massively outgunned in the housing market by people of means who already have a house to live in. I will. Finlay Carson. Very much appreciate Alistair Allen taking my intervention. Would you not also agree part of the balance is that we need uh, sustainable economic growth in these areas to ensure there's, there's jobs and some of those jobs depend on tourism so we actually need tourists coming so we need to get the balance right so there is a, an emphasis on pro uh, providing new social housing not necessarily reducing the number of tourists that come to the, to the islands or rural areas. Alistair Allen. I don't want to reduce the number uh, of tourists coming to the island I absolutely appreciate the point the member is making about the importance of tourism but the companies who write to me in my constituency are tourism related companies who cannot get any workforce in their businesses because there is nowhere for people to live. And so that's why we have to pay some attention to the need for homes for people to live in in this debate. And, presiding officer, people have rightly pointed out 
uh, the importance of tourism. I absolutely accept it, not least in a place like the one that I live in. But in areas where housing is being taken out of the domestic stock at a faster rate than it could ever conceivably be replaced, some perspective is needed. How do the undoubted benefits of a short-term let property compare, say, with the benefits, the social good, uh, to use Murdo Fraser's phrase, brought by a family living in that house 365 days a year and contributing to that community? How do they compare with the benefits brought by a local school having enough pupils to stay open, or a community having a sufficient population of working age to provide carers for the elderly, or enough people for a lifeboat crew, or enough staff for new businesses? Presiding officer, <laughs> My understanding is that my own local authority is currently processing over 180 applications around the licensing scheme, with another 65 pending, determination, and 236 granted. They are taking an average of 36 days to determine applications and estimate there are another 100 hosts who are yet to apply. I have not heard of any who have been rejected. I think it is right that local authorities get to decide how this scheme is implemented so that it meets local needs. Local authorities need to get the operation of this scheme right, I accept, and uh, because, of the tourism because the tourism industry is key to the economy of rural Scotland, we have to get it right. But the wider point we should not lose sight of today is that many local communities presently feel powerless as they watch their local supply of housing vanish before their eyes. And that is why governments sometimes have to intervene and why the Tories' vision, or apparent vision, of a free-for-all in housing in rural Scotland does not work for many of my constituents. Thank you. I call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Could I, could I just confirm the speaking time for this? Because I heard five minutes, but I thought it was six. It is six minutes, Thank you very Ms. Much. Burgess. Before I contribute to this debate, I also want to apologise for being slightly late uh, arriving in the chamber. Presiding officer, I know the benefits the holiday industry can bring to often fragile rural communities. At the same time, I also see and hear the negative impact of poorly managed high turnover properties on the communities I represent. That balance has shifted over the last 10 years. The short-term let sector today is different from what it was a decade ago, and it is right that the Parliament has chosen to regulate a changing market. A great deal of determined and detailed work went into drafting this legislation. Community groups, housing and amenity organisations have voiced their support for licensing regulations and powers to regulate through the planning system. There was substantial consultation over, as we've already heard numerous times, a lengthy period beginning before my time in this chamber, giving communities, operators and lobbyists the opportunity to put their views forward. I know colleagues have engaged with stakeholders frequently and, for example, the go-live date for licensing for most providers was delayed by six months in response to concerns raised by local authorities and industry. So I recognize a heated debate about short-term lets. I recognize that the Tories have picked a side of that debate. But what I don't accept is that we should set aside those community voices crying out for change. Rural communities have been placed under huge pressure by the rapid expansion of this sector. It is time to restore some balance. The Highlands and Islands, the, in the Highlands and Islands, the need for affordable, accessible and adequate homes continues to be pressing. The current housing crisis has many dimensions, reflecting decisions over many decades. Underinvestment in new supply, sale of affordable homes without replacement, empty properties and much else beside. Short-term lets are only one part of this picture. But everyone deserves a safe, affordable and suitable home and short-term lets are at odds 
With this, in certain places, especially many of the rural island locations I represent. Across our rural communities, homes that used to be available to local families now provide accommodation to visitors. Meanwhile, people are pushed onto social housing waiting lists. Short-term lets are just one part of the issue, but that does not mean they can be discounted as part of the solution. And I heard someone wanted to take an intervention. Kate Forbes. Thank the member for, for giving way. Just two very quick points in terms of taking aside the member alluded to. Um, I wonder if she would also though, call out the, the very toxic abuse that's been hurled at some of the B&B owners and self-catering uh, owners as part of this debate. And secondly, that in many cases, actually B&B owners have been earning a livelihood that allows them to stem depopulation in some of the most remote and rural parts of, the Scot of Scotland. Ariane Burgess. I thank the member for that intervention and I will say at the beginning I do recognise the important part uh, that um, short-term lets providers do provide and I think that what we're trying to do here is ensure that across the board Scotland is offering safe accommodation for people who are coming to stay here. Do we need to do more about rural housing supply? Yes, that is why I welcome the new financial package for community housing trusts last month, and I'm looking forward to the rural and island housing action plan soon. Do we need to do more about second homes? Yes, that is why changes to council tax and additional dwelling supplement for second homes are a right step in the right direction. Do we need to do more about housing costs? Yes. That is why the Tories' disastrous debate last, budget, disastrous budget last year was so damaging to interest rates now being faced by first-time buyers and why I support the introduction of rent controls. Do we need to do more about bringing empty homes into use? Absolutely, through continuing reform of planning and land reform. All part of the picture, all needed alongside action on short-term lets alongside. And when I was standing for election, Imarsh and Yellen, a campaign group on Sky that seeks to amplify the voices of local young people, described an existential crisis caused by rising house prices, a dearth of sustainable work, and an increase in holiday let properties. They spoke of being priced out of the villages they grew up in. Presiding officer, I'm going to end with Yamarsh Anielan's words, not my own, as I think it's vital that the voices of young people in our rural and island communities are heard in this debate. They said previously affordable properties are now being sold at thousands of pounds above their asking price, too often to, buy, to buyers who have no intention of living on or at times even visiting Sky. The effect of the current housing market trend is devastating. When looking out over the villages of Staffin or Waternish, half of the lights are out. Former family homes lie dormant for half the year in anticipation of high Please conclude, Ms. Burgess. Looking to experience uh, sky in th uh, three days. Thank you, Ms. Burgess. And I call on Stuart McMillan to be followed by Pam Duncan Clancy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. President Officer, scrutinising legislation is hugely important, and I welcome debate on all legislation proposed by government or by members of this parliament. However, being opposed to legislation and consequently misleading the public on the legislation itself is not good for parliament and does not do the electorate a disservice. It does, it does, sorry, does not do them any type of service. I mean, Murdo Fraser, sadly Murdo Fraser just left the chamber. Murdo Fraser earlier on in his opening comments spoke about uh, this uh, set of proposals as being centralised. Later on, Rachel Hamilton spoke, uh, indicated that uh, they are not centralised and it's going to be a post-code lottery as councils will have the flexibility. We've had other colleagues from across the chamber, Willie Rennie, uh, Sarah Boyack and Sue Weber, also uh, had differing opinions. So it cannot be centralised and also have the postcode lottery that, that certainly the different sides of this chamber are advocating. Now, one of the things, for me, one of the sad things about this whole debate has been some of the, the extreme language that has been used. Uh, it certainly has been less than helpful to say the least. Now, I mean, Kate Forbes uh, asked uh, Ariane a question a moment ago. Now, David Leask at the weekend was spot on uh, in his article in the Herald. 
uh, when, and I'm not going to read out the whole article, but just going to read out one snippet from that article, presenting officer. Uh, and that, uh, and it was this, do we really need to have to say out loud uh, that having to, for example, check a holiday home for deadly waterborne diseases or apply for a licence or planning permission is not the same as being raped, robbed and murdered because you are Jewish? I am afraid so. He also wrote, do we have to explain that using this kind of language diminishes the experiences and insults, the memory of Jews and others who endured horrendous atrocities? Apparently, we do. Now, the use of the phrase pogrom parliament was yeah. beyond distasteful and hope that every single MSP yeah. in this chamber would condemn this type of terminology when this is used unequivocally because this certainly is not that. I will take, yes. Brian Whittle. I just want to take the opportunity uh, to assure the member that everybody in this, time, this side of the chamber concurs with his opinion of that. Stuart McMillan. Uh, I'm happy to hear that, uh, Mr Whittle. Uh, now, to go back to the issue of short-term lets, now, the Conservatives might be surprised to know that I, I, I actually want more short-term lets to take place in my Greenwick and Inverclyde constituency, because we actually have a shortage of accommodation. We've got a shortage of hotels as well as uh, short-term lets. One of our hotels is currently being used by, uh, by the UK government for asylum seekers, and another hotel is being used for the Ukrainians coming in uh, because of the, uh, the war in Ukraine. But uh, so two be seconds, but for this reason, it is positive that the legislation gives Scotland's councils the powers to balance the needs and concerns of their communities with wider economic or tourism interests. And I'll take the intervention. Rachel Hamilton. Yeah, McMillan, presiding officer, I think it's misleading um, to suggest that bringing in this burdensome legislation and licensing scheme is going to solve the government's housing crisis. Stuart McMillan. I'm actually coming on to that, so if you wait for a few moments. Inverclyde is not facing the same challenges uh, as Edinburgh, the Highlands and Islands, or Gillen Butte to name just three local authorities when it comes to this issue of short-term lets, uh, or, for that matter, some of the housing issues. But we need more accommodation to help boost our tourism offer, yet other communities are struggling to cope due to the, the high volume of tourists, with places like Orkney considering curtailing the number of cruise ships docking on the islands. Now, this can be viewed as a nice problem to have, but the reality is that this localised approach uh, will ensure and it can be tailored to best serve the interests of everyone across the country. So, I, note, I note that the Labour Welsh Government are keen to follow in Scotland's footsteps with regards to short-term let legislation. Uh, however, they are looking at taking a centralised approach. Uh, this is something uh, that was spoken about earlier on. And as for the reasons I've outlined, I believe that this... Uh, uh, well, no, I've already taken two interventions. I believe that this will be problematic uh, and would uh, be using the, the proverbial sledgehammer to crack a nut. Inverclyde does not have the same issue as other parts of the country. The Labour also continually calls for local authorities to have more autonomy. Uh, and this legislation that we're talking about today does give them that. And I also find it interesting that the Tories are asking for a further extension when 22 months have gone, uh, gone by since I've, I've already taken two interventions, have gone by since the licensing regulations were passed by this Parliament, including a six-month extension at the request of operators. So I also this modest licensing scheme, which is not going to be onerous for the majority of short-term let operators. Communities across Scotland have for years highlighted the impact the concentration of unregulated short-term lets has had on local infrastructure and housing availability. I mean, Alistair Allen spoke uh, very eloquently about the situation in his constituency. Now, on the, the issue of, um, of housing, now, in my constituency, we have got, we have got um, over 500 vacant properties in the registered social uh, sector. Now, the, the housing minister was in the constituency uh, during the summertime. Uh, I organised a meeting with the chief executives of the RSLs. And that was the message that the minister was told. Now, um, the, the RSLs in my constituency do not want to build any more homes because we have an oversupply. Inverclyde's situation, as I said, is totally different from other parts of the country. Uh, and one of the reasons they don't want to build any more is because of the huge inflationary costs, thanks to the Tory, the Tory budget from last year. <laughs> now, uh, now, presenting officer, uh, the, the, minister, the minister highlighted the detail of the legislative process involving short-term lets. highlighted that earlier on in his contribution. It was extensive, including the six-month extension already. Now, in closing, I am supportive of the short-term lets licensing scheme, as it does help to ensure 
high standards in Scotland's, in Scotland's tourism offer, and it does provide the councils with the tools they need you must to address localised issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Macmillan. And I call Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by Keith Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour believes in the regulation of the short term let sector. We know that it is key to ensuring the health and safety of guests, to protect against rogue owners that exploit the system, to protect our communities and the people who live in them, and to help people caught up in the current housing crisis. All of us in this chamber know about the impact short term lets can have on our communities, good and bad, and we've heard a lot of that this afternoon the disruptive stag or hen, the variety of people coming and going, and who maybe don't have the connection needed to ensure an area is looked after or neighbourhoods are respected. But we also know and have heard about the positive impact it can have too. In Glasgow, I know constituents welcome people from across the world to share their home for big events like cycling or COP26. Doing that provides d diversity, friendship and income for many. And I'll return to some of the other benefits shortly. But the short-term licensing regulations in their current form do not strike this balance, which is why we voted against them when they first came to Parliament and why we continue to believe that they should be paused and rethought today. Yes. Minister. Back to the point I mentioned to Sarah Boyack around about the community organisations that support the new short-term regulations in terms of what we're talking about in its current form, but also your own Edinburgh Labour Councils who support what we are bringing forward just now, and I've, I've re reiterated that. So you can't even convince your own Labour Councils in Edinburgh to support what you, you're, you're... I have spoken to them. Through the Chair, please. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Minister for that intervention, but he has already had an extensive conversation across the Chamber um, and answers from my colleagues on that matter, and so, um, with, with respect, I'll move on. As drafted, the current regulations leave short-term let providers feeling anxious and let down, whilst also failing to help those who are caught up in struggling with the housing crisis. They also fail to recognise or protect some of the benefits of short-term lets, in particular to women and disabled people. Like many other people in here, my inbox is full of emails from constituents asking me to oppose these regulations. Many of them are real people with real livelihoods at stake, because they're worried that we face regulations that act like the whole country is the same when it's not. What works for Glasgow won't necessarily work in the Western Isles. What works for disabled people may not for others. I will. Kevin Stewart. Duncan Glancy for giving way. Can I say to um, Ms Duncan Glancy, that the regulations are not the same across the country. There is flexibility for local authorities. The only parts of the regulations that are national are those covering health and safety. And her colleagues agreed that they should be in place in former discussions. Does she not think that it is wise to ensure that all properties that are being let and used for tourist purposes have these basic safety health and safety requirements met. Pam Duncan Glancy. It, th thank you um, for, for that intervention. And different types of properties are all being included. There's not enough flexibility in the regulations that have been presented to recognise both the benefits and the issues that come with short-term lets to our community. And that's what we are asking the government to rethink about, um, to pause and to make sure that they work for everybody um, in our communities across Scotland. Um, what works for disabled people, for example, may not work for others, and I will come to this. President officer, colleagues have set out why this matters and why the current regulations are inflexible and fail to strike the balance of need, protection or opportunity. So I want to talk briefly about why getting regulations right matters and to set out the potential impact flawed regulations could have on women and disabled people who, if we don't take the time to listen to them, could be disproportionately disadvantaged. Firstly, the blanket approach does not take account of the benefit the flexible approach in the short-term let sector can bring for the host or the guest. Being a host can provide a flexible and rewarding source of income. Indeed, we know that 55 per cent of hosts of Airbnb are women, and the Association of Short-Term Lets say that that is because it is seen as a flexible and balanced way for women to earn, whilst also managing other responsibilities like caring and childcare. Regulations that are inflexible to this or clumsy risk being a barrier to such opportunity, and so it's crucial that we get that right. Some disabled people are worried about this too. One disabled woman who lives with two lifelong illnesses was attracted to this way of earning and working because of its flexibility. She believes that the regulations as they've been put before us today could mean she'll likely not be granted a licence, and she's devastated about that. That potential impact is now having a detrimental effect on her mental and physical health. 
Furthermore, the ability to share or swap your home with other disabled people from across the world has long facilitated an accessible route to tourism for disabled people, including houses you live in, in the, reg um, in the regulations could be unaffordable and put an end to that. Indeed, the short-term let sector has some other useful accessibility aspects that a pause in the regulation could facilitate happening too, including, for example, some platforms allow a filter that, that drills right down into accessibility, and it's very helpful and detailed. Updating the regulations could present an opportunity to do this in other parts of the sector. But, President Officer, I'm afraid once again we've got a position where people up and down the country are feeling the impact of a policy that may well have good intentions, but which has been poorly executed. And it happens too much. I've seen it in Glasgow with the LEZ, which also incidentally disproportionately impacts women and disabled people. Good intentions are not enough to make policy work. The government also has to do the hard work of engaging and considering and adapting and changing including with the people that will impact the most. And the government have again tried to address a problem by implementing a solution that itself will create many more problems. So, President Officer, in closing, we believe there is a need for regulation. I believe that and Scottish Labour support that, but the current plans are far from the mark. And so I ask that the government listen to the concerns raised today across the chamber and act in the interests of people across Scotland. Please don't plough ahead regardless. Listen to the real concern and work with others, including Scottish Labour, to address it so that, we are, so that these regulations are fit for purpose and that they have their intended effect without the unintended consequences. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Keith Brown, the final speaker in the open debate. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, for my part, would agree with the last uh, point that was made by uh, Pam Blanche Duncan about the fact that the government should and others should listen to what's being said today. I found it very useful myself uh, to listen to the points that have been raised. It's been generally uh, a constructive debate with one or two exceptions. Um, and, of course, that uh, debate today and some of the points that were raised add to the information that we have from our mailboxes um, and also, in my case, certainly from hearing from ministers prior to this debate about some of these issue, issues. It is clear that there are uh, genuine concerns, there is no doubt about that, uh, raised by some of those affected, not by everybody. I do think there seems to be a notable absence or paucity amongst a number of people speaking up for guests and those that might have concerns about safety uh, and other issues when they take out a short-term let. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's important that we do hear the concerns wherever they come from. Uh, and I've been interested to hear some of those points, uh, including from some of my colleagues, about some of the concerns that either they or uh, other constituents have. Uh, and given those concerns, I'd want to see, for my part, whether there is a reasonable lead-in time uh, before this takes effect. Now, there has been 20 months um, has elapsed, I think, since this has been first uh, agreed. Um, I think I'd want to see a dialogue having taken place, and that dialogue has taken place. We've heard, I think, from Kevin Stewart and some of the things which have changed since the initial proposals. That tells me that there's not just been a dialogue, but there's been listening on, on the part of the government. Uh, and it's not, of course, achieved all the changes that those that have remaining objections want to see um, taken into effect, but it has been taking place, and I think that's right that government should do that. And of course, the, the government also has to, to go back to the first point, to commit to continuing that dialogue, and I'm hearing that the government intends to do this. So it's very important that ministers listen. And looking at my post bag, I would admit most of the people that get in touch with me um, have expressed concerns. They are, by and large, not from my constituency. The ones which I have, I've had representation saying they don't agree with the government's approach. They think it should go much further because of the effect that short-term lets are having in their neighbourhood. But there are others, uh, whether from organisations or individually, who have also expressed, my cons uh, expressed concerns. And on that, and to go back to the debate, I think we started off re relatively reasonably with uh, Willie Rennie's uh, contribution, where he recognised the good elements of the scheme. He also mentioned some concerns. But one thing he did say was about the impact of second homes. And he did say words to the effect that he didn't have a solution for that to put forward, perhaps because this debate is not, uh, it's not about that. But it is a very, very difficult case to resolve, a difficult situation to resolve. We've heard it from others as well. And that involves getting competing interests together, as a government has to do, and trying to uh, adjudicate on a way forward. But the government will have to take action. And I think that's exactly what's happening in this case. And, and I, so I think it started off relatively positively. From the Labour Party, I have to say, it just seems like opportunism. If you have a council leader saying one week, saying that he wants a break, and then 
two days later saying he doesn't want a break. If you're saying you want a national scheme, uh, sorry, a decentralised scheme, whereas the Labour Party in Wales uh, is looking for a, a national scheme, it just seems to me like opp opportunism. And I don't really, from the contributions I've heard, get what Labour want to get from uh, the scheme. And the Conservatives, I think we've seen it all before, the kind of blanket condemnation, ruling it out, it's SNP bad, we don't want to listen, we don't want anything to do with it. It's the same stuff that we've seen for many years. Yes, I'll give way to Ms. Briggs. Ms. Briggs. Ms. Briggs. Great. I'm grateful for the member taking this intervention. If this policy is working so well, why have 80% of people not applied for this policy? And what is the government going to do about that in the next two weeks? Keith Brown. The deadline hasn't passed yet. I'm not aware of any problem issues with dealing with the... I know when they get criticised, they don't like it, and they start shouting. Yes, sir, will be. Kevin Stewart. Presiding officer, uh, that one of the reasons why um, some folks, uh, a number of folk, have chosen not to apply is because they have been told not to apply by various members within this place and by other organisations <laughs> because they said that the government would fall. Members. Does Mr Brown agree? Members. The terms of the debate have been terrible in, in, in the way the Tories have dealt with it. Because as ever, all it is is about attacking the SNP, and you'll hear them now start to shout because they're hearing something that conflicts with their worldview. But to be honest, this constant negativity, this kind of approach they've taken, we can see where it's got 14% in the opinion polls. So many of you are not going to be here in the next parliament. It doesn't work. The least you should be doing is try to constructively engage. And you do not serve those that you say you want to serve, including those in the gallery, by taking the approach that you've taken, talking about an existential threat to the tourist industry. The tourist industry will still be here. And of course, it should be reviewed if there's an impact from this on the tourist industry. And I know you're all shouting again. I know you don't like it, but I'm not giving way. I just say, if you take a Let's much more Mr. positive Brown. approach... A much more positive, but you actually genuinely try to change something for the better, rather than waiting, continuing, criticising, opposing every single thing the government opposes. You don't serve the people who have genuine concerns well by doing that. So I am reassured that the government has taken on board the points which have been made to them by both interest groups and individuals, that they have changed the proposals, that they have given a long lead in time, including, of course, a six-month uh, um, uh, hiatus where further uh, views were taken on board. That sounds to me like the way a response responsible government should act, and it's for that reason I'll support the government's motion tonight. Thank you. We move to winding up speeches, and I call on Daniel, Daniel Johnson up to six uh, minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer, and again, can I apologise to colleagues that they're having to listen to me twice in this debate, but uh, there we go. Um, look, I, I, can I just begin by saying it's quite a curious approach from Keith Brown to mm -hmm. praise the debate for its constructive nature and then immediately launch into partisan detractions, because actually I think this is detailed news. I think there are points of a genuine consensus both about, I think, the need that we support our tourism sector, but also the need to think very carefully about housing supply. And I don't think there's a single member that has spoken this afternoon that would disagree with those, those two fundamental points. The point is about how we strike the balance. And balance and flexibility are two of the words that we've heard time and time again through this debate. And can I begin, perhaps, I think, by praising uh, Ben McPherson, who I think made an absolutely excellent speech. I agree with absolutely every one of his points of, of analysis. This is a city that, uh, that has both an absolute reliance on, on tourism. We need to nurture that sector. We need short-term lets as part of our mix and accommodation. But we also have to recognise the severe challenges we have in housing. And I, like him, have stairs in my constituency where there is key lock after key lock. And it's not scientific, but it is a sign of the scale that this has had. Uh, the, 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 we've seen residential properties moving out of residential use and we see chains of, of uh, Airbnbs springing up across the city and that's something that we need to tackle. However, what I would point out and what I try to draw out in this debate is what we shouldn't confuse is that ability to control the number with this regime which is about uh, standards and, uh, 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 and the quality of the accommodation provided. Now, I would just caution ministers, because a number of uh, SNP members have made the assertion that this is about tackling the flow of, re and I think that was a word that was used by the ministry, even, and growth of this sector, seeing transfers out of private residential use into, now if we're losing the licensing regime to do that, that's what the government's saying, I think they need to be quite careful about their legal position, because I'm not sure you can use the licensing regime to do that. So let's just be careful, but let's also be precise. The planning regime 
is how we control the number. That is what is in place to do that. Now, there are, I think there are issues with that. I would actually like to, a, a more calibrated use uh, and efficient use. And I think some of the issues we've seen in the city is because that precision isn't in place in the regime that had been brought forward. But I'd also like to praise Willie Rennie because there's ultimately, I think this point about that balance, that tension about providing jobs in parts of rural Scotland so that you need that balance, not just as part of broader tourism, but actually to bring people into places. And that is tricky. But ultimately, we do need to acknowledge the broader fact that this is about housing supply. But let's be clear. There is no doubt that the, the move of private residential residences into the short term, as I said, does not help. But it is not the fundamental problem. The reality of the situation is that housing completions in this country have never recovered from the rates and levels of 2008. If this government had managed to meet and achieve the average uh, level of completions of 25,000, which is what the last uh, Labour Liberal Democrat administration in this place did, we'd have 100,000 more houses in Scotland. Now, absolutely, we need to tackle this issue, but this is not a substitute. This is not a proxy for housing policy. This does not displace, this is not a substitute for completing housing across every sector. Very happy to give way to Kevin Stewart. Kevin Stewart. Um, I thank Mr Johnson for giving way, and uh, he's right. Um, this licensing regime uh, will not deal um, with housing per se uh, and housing supply. What this uh, was meant to do uh, was to ensure that there were basic health and safety standards in all of these short-term lets and across the sector, driving up quality. Now, that's why, and there is some confusion here today, um, the flexibility that local authorities have in terms of the licen re licensing regime, some of which has been raised by members, is theirs. They have that flexibility. However, I'm sure that even uh, Mr Johnson would agree that that health and safety aspect should apply across the board, because we do not want people coming uh, to live in unsafe accommodation. Daniel Johnson. Uh, oh, I thank Kevin Stewart for that speech. Um, but the, the reality is that, that we had an issue, but it was not one of standards. Now, of course we want consistent health and safety standards, but we're, we're taking one problem and applying a solution that deals with, it, with another. And I think we need to be very careful about that. And what's more, I would contest his point about flexibility because Paul Lawrence, uh, uh, the, the, uh, an official, a very senior official at Edinburgh Council, wrote to Edinburgh MSP stating that they didn't have the flexibility, that on the critical issues mm. around house swaps, about room lettings, that the council had to apply the regulations comprehensively. Now, if that's a, a, a not true, I would urge the Scottish Government to write to the council, but actually what I would urge them to do is revise the regulations to remove these, because I think Christine Graham made an excellent contribution, because my, my mailbag looks much like hers. There is a very broad range of people that have found themselves in this sector who have done it honestly, decently. They're not big businesses, and they find this confusing and really deeply worrying, uh, uh, potentially uh, incurring huge costs. And that's because there's a huge broad range of sectors that are now sucked into this. Uh, B&Bs, room lets, uh, 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 glamping pods, yurts, uh, chalets types of accommodation that cannot, will never be used for residential accommodation that are being required to, 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 to uh, obtain these licences. And what's more, because of the nature of these regulations, we even have the absurdity about people who may be staying overnight who uh, only have to, uh, who, who are asked to maybe consider a donation or maybe even do work in return for their overnight stay. So are we in a situation where people who are simply uh, asked to do a small amount of work, you know, do some chores, could find themselves where their, their hosts have to apply for a licence? We simply don't know the answer to that question. Must so ask I would, you to conclude, I will, Mr I'll Johnson. Just conclude here. This is not a system that has flexibility. It's a, a solution uh, that is uh, uh, seeking to address a problem that was not the one that we originally set out. And it's a national scheme that we are requiring uh, local authorities to implement, regardless of whether they want to or not. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Richard Lockhead up to seven minutes, Minister, please. Thank you, officer. I'm not quite sure I can say I've enjoyed the debate. It certainly had some interesting contributions from across the chamber. Uh, and that is no reference to the fact that the two contributions from Daniel Johnson today, uh, that's only improved the quality of the debate, of course, uh, having that. But I do think perhaps there's something for the presenting officer to reflect upon that front bench speeches 
should only be delivered perhaps by MSPs who are in the chamber at the time. Um, is something that perhaps we could all reflect on uh, as well. But I do want to say that as Minister for both Tourism and Small Business, I recognise not only the value of the short-term let sector as it is, but the need to plan ahead for a sustainable future and high standards through effective regulation. Having visited a number of self-catering lets over the summer, I very much appreciate the value that short let accommodation plays in our tourism sector. Bed and breakfasts, self-catering accommodation, castles, bunkhouses, the list goes on and on and on. And of course, all offer accommodation to visitors so they can explore our amazing country. And of course, all should offer a safe and quality stay. And that was a very important point made by Ben McPherson and some other speakers as well. Yeah. Myrtle Fraser. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. As of last month, only, uh, I think, 16% of short-term lets had applied for a licence. What is the level the Minister wants to get that to, to deem this licensing scheme a success? Minister. What I want to get to is that every single MSP in this chamber, from across all the parties, urges publicly short-term let hosts to apply for the licence before the 1st of October. Then the local authorities will have their 12 months to discuss and perhaps negotiate with local hosts before the licence is issued. And as you've heard, no licences so far have been rejected. That would be the most responsible step to take for all members in this chamber. I'll take one more intervention. Douglas Ross. Forgiving way, he will know uh, in Murray this is uh, a serious issue, and one of our joint constituents came to see him at his Avis surgery, and he shared the information that he shared with the minister. This constituent applied for three properties in the Highland Council area, applied for planning permission on the 3rd of October 2022. It should have been determined by December 2022. It is still outstanding. So how can we get the figure up from 16%, as Murdo Fraser is saying, when our own constituents cannot get through the process? Minister. Of, of course, local authorities should be doing their best to work with those who apply, but I should say we've gone from 20% from Miles Brigg to 16% of numbers so far from uh, Myrtle Fraser, and my own constituency today is 40%, so it seems to be doubling every few minutes the number of uh, businesses that are applying for their licences throughout Scotland. These, these are very important. These are very important issues, and that's why there's flexibility with local authorities. And that's why we're saying, by the 1st of October, following another extension, that the businesses should apply for the licence. They don't have to have the licence to continue trading legally. I'll take one more. Miles Briggs. The Minister. He'll recognise this name, Avril Rennie, because she won um, Scottish bed and breakfast of the year, he wrote to congratulate her, the Seamill, uh, Carlton Seamill bed and breakfast in Ayrshire. Now, she's saying that it's too complex and costly a, costly a system in Ayrshire and is likely to then not apply for this. So there is a need for a phased approach beyond that 1st of October deadline. Does the minister understand that? And are they going to do anything about that or just wait for the 1st of October and that cliff edge for many businesses and people? Minister. <laughs> I, I hope that lady does apply because she's got a fantastic business and that's why I wrote to her congratulating her. That's also why the Housing Minister and others have been speaking to local authorities about the bureaucracy. There's been a situation in my own constituency, I understand, where the online portal has not been ideal and the local council, the Conservative-led council, are improving that and hopefully that will lead to easier applications in the next few weeks. I want to turn to a couple of themes that members have mentioned because I see I'm running out of time because of my interventions. Uh, firstly, these are serious social economic issues we're speaking about today. I thought Alistair Allen made a very powerful point raising that because many people portray this as an urban issue just affecting uh, Edinburgh or perhaps other countries, Paris and New York and so on and so forth, but it's not. It's very much a rural issue and particularly in Scotland as well. As a minister, often I go around rural communities, and as I did again this summer, and I speak to young people sometimes, or anyone who says, you can't get a house in this community because they're either second homes or holiday lets. 
And the dilemma we face as a government's parliamentarians is we need holiday lets, and it's not illegal to have a second home. And indeed, in some countries, it's the culture to have second homes. We've taken the intervention so far. So this is very much a social economic issue, and we shouldn't shy away from it, and we should recognise there's a need for regulation. Jamie Green said, why did the Scottish Government, if it's such a big issue, not deal with it 16 years ago? When this government was elected, Airbnb didn't exist. Airbnb did not exist. The world is changing. The world is changing. People are using technology. They're buying properties, understandably. They're seeing it as a commercial opportunity. They're putting it onto the web. They're using Airbnb and other platforms because now you can do that. And, of course, tourists around the world wanting to come to an amazing country want to take advantage of that. So it's a booming sector. But that has social economic implications, as Alistair Allen and other uh, members have said. So we have to deal with that, and that's what this is about. There will be an early review in early 2024 following the implementation. And remember, we are urging people to apply for the licence before the end of the month. And then the local authorities, as I said before, will have that year to work with the businesses. So let's make sure the outcome of this is a thriving self-catering sector and short-term let sector in Scotland, covering all the, the various forms mentioned in this debate. And let's ensure that we have a thriving tourism sector. We're not the only country dealing with this. We're not the only parliament in the world dealing with this. Uh, New York, Paris, Barcelona, the Welsh are now looking at it, as we've heard. The English are looking at it, as we've heard. Um, Portugal, France, Spain, they're all looking at it, both in urban and rural areas, because the world's changing and it's having social or economic impacts where people sometimes can't afford to live and work in the communities where they're raised, or local businesses, including tourism, can't get key workers because they can't find anywhere else to live as well. And, of course, because tourism is booming, everyone deserves that accommodation is safe, secure and compliant. So let's work together, make that happen, and encourage as many people as possible to apply for the licence before the 1st of October. Thank you. And I call on Miles Briggs to wind up the debate. Uh, up to nine minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, last week, um, I, along with MSPs from, I think, all the opposition parties anyway, met with protesters outside Parliament. It is something we do on most uh, weeks and welcome constituents uh, to Parliament. But this was something very different because the people I met outside Parliament had never protested in their lives before. These were hardworking, law-abiding Scottish citizens who are running bed and breakfasts, guest houses across Scotland, individuals who are renting out a room to tourists or workers and have done so for years. And I welcome many of them to the gallery today as well. But they felt compounded to come to Parliament to try to speak to ministers and their MSPs uh, from SNP and Green parties, to try to get them to listen. And that is what we are trying to do today as well, to listen to the very real concerns on how short-term let policy has been implemented by councils across Scotland and the negative impact this will have on the lives and businesses of so many of our fellow citizens. Last Wednesday, they were ignored by SNP and Green ministers, the honourable exception being Fergus Ewing. And I want to pay for tribute to Fergus Ewing for his principled stance on this and his campaigning. I'm sure ministers have also faced that, but I wish they would listen. Because, presiding officer, during the passage of the short-term lets legislation at local government and housing and planning committee, ministers were warned about the unintended consequences of this wide-ranging reach of the policy, especially around this hard date for registration of the 1st of October. Now, we offered to work with the Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robson, at the time to try to find a cross-party consensus and workable approach to legislation, regulations and the guidance, guidance which has now been issued on several occasions to councils across the country. And behind the scenes, I think the new Housing Secretary, uh, Cap uh, Minister, was also doing the same. He understood at the time uh, the problems which were quite clearly coming on the horizon. I welcomed the six-month extension to the policy and hoped ministers would use this summer to understand these problems and issues and bring forward workable suggestions to Parliament before the 1st of uh, October deadline, especially following the ruling that the City of Edinburgh Council's licensing policy was found to be unlawful under judicial review. Linking planning systems and licensing systems, as Daniel Johnson has mentioned, was always going to be problematic, but ministers don't seem to understand the consequences of that. Ministers were warned that without significant advertising campaigns, that the busy summer period individual households and businesses face in Scotland and across any summer tourism period would not give them the time to complete applications, undertake work, get tradespeople 
and then provide the necessary documentation. Sue Weber and Christine Graham made some really important points on this from constituents who are just saying that uh, to each and every one of us. For example, though, ministers could, if they wanted to, and could today take forward and agree on a new phased introduction beyond the 1st of October. Now, I hope that's something ministers genuinely beyond the vote tonight as well will take away and consider. Giving businesses, bed and breakfast and guest houses, and those who do home sharing, a phased introduction beyond the 1st of October is important. Presiding officer, the Edinburgh festivals, which have not been mentioned by a tourist minister, but they are the world's largest art festival. It's rightly helped make Edinburgh the world capital of culture. I welcome that, and I think every MSP who represents the capital uh, have mentioned that. These unrivaled cultural pro programmes deliver a major economic uplift to businesses, jobs and livelihoods across the capital and further, further afield in our country. Cities around the world which are growing their art festivals would give their right arm to become as successful as Edinburgh festivals have been. Indeed, many will be looking at the potential impact on next year's festival and seeing how they can benefit and try to become the world's largest art festival. And it's clear that ministers understood the negative impact of the short-term let's legislation on this year's festival when they brought forward the delayed date of the 1st of October, uh, October to help the festival get through this year, knowing the consequences. Yes. Yep. Just a few points that you brought up, and I think there are a few key ones. The festival, just to, to tackle that first, I engaged with the festival as we both did prior to becoming the minister and, and obviously discussed that with them, and as did the cabinet secretary, and I think that was one of the reasons for the six-month extension. In terms of engagement, I've met with people in terms of both for and against the, 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 the scheme that we've talked about. What we're talking about here is safety standards, and we're talking about average costs of 200 to 400, 250 to 450 pounds, and we're talking about safety standards. That's what's not been mentioned in the debate about there. In terms of national and local campaigns, there's been two local ca national campaigns run by the Scottish Government, and if you go onto the, any website now, there's any local authority, they are pushing and promoting this scheme. And I hope, as it's been mentioned before by Mr Lockhead, we encourage everybody to sign up for this before the 1st of October. Local authorities have 12 months thereafter to determine their application. None have been refused so far. Um, well, I'm not sure the Minister is really understanding, though, where this policy sits, because 80% of people have not applied yeah. in Edinburgh. So if he thinks this is indicative of a great scheme which is fit for purpose and delivering, he is wrong. These people have decided not to apply for a reason. And we're seeing the impact on bed nights being withdrawn already. And the cost of the Edinburgh Festival this year is at its highest level ever. In addition, the number of properties listed here in the capital has also dropped to a record low from 8,307 8, to 7,993. And it is concerning, as I've said, Edinburgh City Council are saying that they expect an 80% reduction in short-term lets um, in the city. Local authorities' registers are ind indicating that across Scotland as well. In Edinburgh, the figure was standing at 97%. That is an unsustainable position, and this policy is failing not only at housing policy, but the tourism potential we all want to see grow and improve. But the fact is, SNP, MSPs and MPs don't seem to understand who is being captured in this. As I said earlier, Tommy Shepherd says this isn't about home sharing, but it most definitely is, and they are captured. It's the most basic of economic principles of supply and demand, and fewer rooms available will produce higher costs for anyone wanting to come and spend time in Scotland. As every speaker has said during the debate, no one is against regulation, and health and safety uh, should be, and I believe in the vast majority of cases, paramount to anyone operating in this sector. They want people to have a safe stay, either in their home or in their property they're letting out. Now, as Murdo Fraser stated, a well-regulated short-term let sector is a social good. It's important not just to tourists, but to many other sectors society, in our society, including commercial travellers going to the Western Isles to work, and also here in the capital as well. Presiding officer, today's debate presents Parliament with an opportunity to pause the introduction of the legislation and urgently reassess its impacts, not only on the tourism sector, but the wider economy and people's lives during the cost of living crisis. This debate isn't about inflicting a defeat on the government. It's about Parliament delivering workable legislation and good governance. Yep. Ministers and the two ministers who have spoken in this debate, I think acknowledging when they have got something wrong isn't weak, it's strong. And I hope both of them will take away from this debate the need to do something, not just move forward without taking on board the real concerns. 
The short-term le legislation is not going to help solve the housing crisis in Scotland. What this legislation is going to do is drive a crisis in the Scottish tourism sector, and that is something they will be responsible for doing as a government. SNP ministers should therefore take this opportunity we have brought today to Parliament to pause the regulations now and take forward meaningful engagement to arrive at a proportionate, fair, legally sound legislative framework that works for everyone in Scotland. I support the motion in Murder Fraser's name. Thank you. That concludes the debate on pausing the short-term licensing scheme. Point of order, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I understand you were in the chair, uh, but during the last uh, debate there was a suggestion by Minister Richard Lockhead uh, that another member should have been in the chamber to participate. Um, and I seek uh, your guidance uh, on this uh, because I think without knowledge of why another member may choose to participate remotely in a hybrid parliament that all uh, parties signed up to uh, is potentially uh, disrespectful. Uh, and I'm concerned that such language uh, might become part uh, of our debate. Uh, I don't consider uh, calling out other members uh, for how they uh, choose to participate in the Parliament to be a debating point, uh, and I'd be interested in your views on the matter. Thank you, uh, Mr Mundell. I'll respond to Mr Mundell's point of order, if I may. Um, and just, just really for clarity to all members, the position is that the rules allow members to participate in the chamber or remotely. Those are the rules of the parliament. Thank you. Uh, Richard Lockhead. For the, for the record, I wasn't referring to the individual or the individual circumstances, only front bench speeches, front bench speeches, front bench speeches, not the individuals or the circumstances. Well, um, I, I would just say again and to the minister... Parliament's rules are such that members may participate in the chamber or remotely. Thank you. We'll move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 10420 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak on the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 10420 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. And the next item of business is consideration of business motion 10421 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on timetabling of a bill at stage one. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. And once again, moved, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 10421 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. And there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. And can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Paul McLennan is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Mark Griffin will fall. And the first question is that amendment... 10411.3 in the name of Paul McLennan, which seeks to amend motion 10411 in the name of Murdo Fraser on pausing the short term let's licensing scheme be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote and there'll be a short suspension to allow members to access digital voting. <laughs>